So let's see what other people have published. I am going to uh, reset uh, this page, see what the hell people are trying to say. And uh, I do ask people now to uh, work with the uh, published link. We have a link that is published. I will uh, pin it to the top of my page on my public community fan page. And that is the one that uh, Ramona Halitha Henry can choose to work with. My apologies to her for not being able to communicate with her recently with everything that was going down. I'm certain with what I'm going to relate as the show goes on, she'll understand what was happening. And uh, so I am going to start the program within a matter of moments. We are at the top of the hour and uh, definitely everyone who is able to communicate with us, uh, it's deeply appreciated if they would do so. So let me uh, edit the uh, post. Ramona Halitha Henry says, we are now loud and clear. Uh, thank the gods of my ancestors. And um, let me just get this uh, in here. Good. Get rid of the subscribe. And uh, there we are. Um, that will hopefully get this going. And um, just altering that promotional banner to include this link. So everybody can work with the promotional banner as well as published on my Facebook timelines. It is now one minute after the hour. We will be uh, going full bore into the transmission with a matter within a matter of moments, and I do want uh, everyone to uh, bow down on their knees before Combat Communications Officer uh, Pavel, and uh, he is responsible for our being here tonight. Uh, we dearly miss our sister in the struggle, Rose Dio. And uh, credit goes to her, of course, for um, making us aware of her situation in time to deal with it on the last transmission. Our situation on this transmission was even more extreme. Uh, there's really no describing it. But I will uh, ask of Mr. Edward that he do describe it next uh, time we are on a transmission. It will probably take a good half hour at least to describe what happened to him. That's how extreme it was. Uh, so I'm going to start with my shout outs now. We're two minutes after the hour. So I uh, want to thank Richard Edwards. I got a uh, money order in the mail from him for uh, a good $40. Thank you. Uh, that helps immensely. Every bit helps. Uh, look forward to other people. We do not have the ability to insert ads anymore now that Rose Dio is gone. Uh, Mr. Edward and I will work on that later in the week. Uh, likely this will be uh, published as well on the Douglas Dietrich channel without ads. Everyone who was going to the Mystic Warrior channel before, that is strictly archival at this point in time. Uh, and it's limited in its archives. It doesn't have the most recent ones. You have to look for them on Douglas Dietrich YouTube channel at this point, which I am now linking through all of my promotional banners and uh, all of my other uh, signatures. Whenever you see a post published by myself on Facebook, all you need to do is look at the sign off on that post and you will see the Douglas Dietrich uh, channel for YouTube uh, presented in terms of linkage. Subscribe to that. Tap on the notifications bell so that you will receive notifications of when we're live streaming. And you will also have to go to that channel now for uh, my current archives. And uh, we are gradually going to set up an independent server. Uh, in, until then, we are on YouTube as well as we can be, thanks to the services of uh, CCO Pavel, uh, Compact Communications Officer. I'm not quite sure if Executive producer, executive producer, using the male gentrification of that term. Uh, I'm not quite sure if executive producer is the uh, title he would like, so I'll discuss that with him later. Um, in the meantime, uh, I want to thank as well uh, Ronald Stroini. Uh, deeply appreciated everything that he does. I'm uh, going to give him a call later, and uh, we uh, – <clears throat> And I want Ronald Stroini to communicate with Pavel Edward. Uh, very important that he do so. In the meantime, uh, glad they're friends on Facebook now. Now, with uh, everything that I've exposed about Facebook in the past, uh, I, of course, get questions from naive people asking me why I am on it. It's like uh, talking about the old railroad robber barons who were expanding into the far west of the United States. Uh, violently uh, generating wars all across the world, uh, across the Pacific, ultimately, uh, by their actions. And uh, it, there was no other method of transportation that was practicable for anybody who was a journalist exposing the crimes against unions, union busting, etc., whatever else violence was being utilized, the causation of wars uh, for the sake of profiteering by the railroad robber barons that led to the establishment 
establishment of what we know today as the military industrial complex at its most base. Uh, so uh, anybody who wanted to travel uh, the world or within the United States at that period of history of expansion of that technology had to ride the rails. It's the same thing with why I'm still on Facebook. It's not like we really have a choice. You might say there's other social venues. There's really, comparatively speaking, not that much use to those social venues just yet at least. They don't offer that much of a, uh, a, a, of a competitive uh, choice. Uh, that's the problem with monopolies in the United States. Uh, such as uh, FedEx and uh, UPS, pretty much that duopoly of uh, service providers uh, for shipping uh, prevents any startup companies from uh, providing competition. Uh, and uh, that's the way it is with social media right now. Uh, so um, we'll get into the politics of that at some point in the near future. I'm going to try uh, my absolute best, if at all possible, barring uh, anything else happening uh, in the interim uh, to on uh, Wednesday of uh, next week, because I believe this is Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. I'm going to try to uh, speak to the uh, concept of uh, the Churchoa or the reality thereof, because they come in tonight. Uh, into um, the fires of California. And uh, I will be mentioning them briefly. People who are familiar with me know of uh, their history and uh, know of their impact on uh, people's dream states across the United States and across the world. And I will uh, probably be trying to concentrate on that as a paranormal phenomena in the Wednesday transmission. Uh, after Wednesday, uh, by Sunday, we hope to have our uh, volcano crown princess of the Pacific our Pacific correspondent speak to us about genocide in Papua New Guinea, a very important topic to her. I am going to uh, try and put up some posts to prepare people for that uh, inevitability of her coming on uh, again, barring anything happening. Uh, as it looks now, she should be able to come on with us. Our biggest problem now would be technology. Uh, we were unable to uh, bring Daniel Arola on with us the other day uh, because of these bandwidth issues. We hope to solve these bandwidth issues by Wednesday's transmission and hopefully by Sunday be stable enough to bring on a guest for a period of time. And uh, in the case of uh, Daniel Arola, our dear brother in battle, what happened the other day, I'm not quite sure where he is right now. I hope he's out there. Uh, and uh, we are getting choppy, uh, according to um, Lena Shea. Thank you for informing us of that. Uh, just going to bring that to uh, Pavel's attention. I don't know if there's anything he can do about that. Ah, Daniel Larola is out there. I thank him for making himself known. Hugs, brother. Uh, we can't even bring him on tonight, even into um, any anything with us, because we're operating off Pavel's laptop. We are in the backup of the backup tonight. Uh, and uh, the main computer that Pavel Edward uh, was working with is 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 dead in the water right now. And uh, so um, the backup system we had um, is now backed up uh, by a, a third mechanism. And uh, we thank the gods, our ancestors, that Pavel Edward has, of course, uh, taken to a triple redundancy system uh, based on the NASA model <laughs> that was he was inspired to follow. Uh, based on his reading of Garden on the Moon, which brought him back, of course, to the uh, era of the 70s when he was growing up amidst the early days of the space race. And uh, so that inspired him to um, uh, mechanically uh, back himself up or we wouldn't have been on at all tonight. And uh, so we are on thanks to that. And uh, aside from all of that, the last time that we were on uh, our latest transmission, what happened was we had so little bandwidth that uh, it was the electronic equivalent of my being uh, in a fiberglass bathtub on the open seas and then having Daniel Rolla jump in uh, to that bathtub and saying, hey, Doug! and then both of us, you know, overturning and sinking into the sea. Uh, that was, of course, due to Pavel Edward dealing with multitasking and the challenge of uh, dealing with incoming private messages on Facebook from Ramona Halitha Henry, uh, Grandma Dame, uh, keeping him uh, up, uh, you know, up to date on everything down to the minute. And uh, that was also due to, of course, our uh, dear friend, um, 
Oh, God, Rose Dio, who was speaking to him on Skype private messaging in the text box. And then so he decided he would try to relieve his burden by bringing Daniel Arola directly onto the program with myself, so to speak, or at least on the same bandwidth. And that just knocked us off uh, completely. That's how frail everything is. And our dear Ramona Halitha Henry is keeping in touch with Pavel. Uh, she says that um, the Skype connection, which he's keeping going, uh, is uh, choppy. And uh, it actually says offline, but then goes back online. I ask everyone to be patient with all of this because uh, we're lucky to be on at all. So now that we've kind of given you the technical background for why everything is so incredibly fucked, uh, we will um, get into the transmission proper so I can get into the zone. Uh, I will be periodically, of course, checking for incoming messages. Uh, I'm not uh, technically savvy enough to give myself a double screen, so you'll hear me going back and forth once in a while, just clicking to see what's on uh, the various communications between the timelines. And uh, again, I thank you all for um, just being here and uh, helping to spread the word uh, that uh, we have changed our, um, our, our source of transmission. So um, we want everyone to uh, make certain everyone else is aware that our uh, transmissions are going to be sourcing from the uh, Douglas Dietrich channel and the archives will also be sourcing from the Douglas Dietrich channel. Uh, so at the moment, uh, we are in California, I myself, uh, am such. Uh, Pavel Edward is in Canada. And of course, uh, so is our dear brother, Justin White, who we always think of whenever I think of Canada. And uh, in California, on the other hand, what we have is fire, fire everywhere. So my primary purpose is to get everyone caught up right now, and probably for the majority of this transmission on the firefight. And uh, because there's many fellow Californians out there that I am hosting this transmission for, it's not just for everyone who normally listens, it is in particular uh, tonight uh, for the my fellow Californians. Uh, and Ramona Halitha Henry says, bless you, Pavel, you're doing a fantastic job. Keep it going, brother. And God bless you too, Ramona Halitha Henry. And uh, certainly um, she is a person who does support me as well uh, as a sponsor. Uh, without her, of course, I would just be another homeless veteran and uh, very appreciative of her help and everyone else who uh, assists her in helping me uh, by also helping me so that the burden doesn't lie entirely on herself and uh, what she helps to uh, provide. Uh, we also want to make certain everyone is aware of Ben Estenius, manofthesoil.com, and we will uh, pre-cord an ad uh, for him as my primary sponsor as well sometime in the very near future, uh, Pavel and myself, uh, uh, within the next 72 hours. And uh, remind everyone, of course, to uh, check out uh, his uh, website, manofthesoil.com, and get uh, from there to theunfinishedman.com. And uh, then, of course, the uh, uh, Tucson tours uh, that he provides uh, the website, uh, which I don't even remember, but that's fine. Uh, I can get that from him again uh, very quickly and uh, kind of go over um, my own ad blurbs with uh, Paul, uh, Paul Edward in the uh, near future. In the meantime, we'll get to the science of these fires and uh, one of the reasons why they're happening in terms of why it's so easy to commit arson uh, that in this environment becomes uh, just uh, beyond all control in terms of wildfire generation. Uh, so in terms of the science thereof, uh, there be simple reason that humans can't control, cannot control wildfires. 27 years ago, um, I myself took an hour-long drive with a couple of friends to see the Oakland firestorm of 1991 uh, right in my home area, uh, my own uh, stomping grounds, uh, my turf, my territory, if you will, of uh, my gang affiliates and myself. 
the greater San Francisco, greater Bay Area metroplex region, which includes, of course, the city of Oakland, uh, which is uh, predominantly an African-American uh, metropolis. And uh, the um, more elite or um, moneyed area of Oakland was in the Oakland Hills. That was the area that was predominantly a white community within what otherwise is a black city. And uh, it was on my birthday uh, that, uh, of course, uh, Michael Aquino uh, had uh, been so disgusted with the way everything had turned out with myself. And uh, a number of his operations that I had shut down, I had, of course, I just recently been dishonorably discharged from the Marine Corps. There was another uh, child pornography ring that was, of course, headquartered in the San Diego Marine Corps uh, recruit depot that uh, I had broken open uh, that was in the process of being investigated. And within a few years, it would be shut down uh, completely. And uh, that was just another avenue of human exploitation and trafficking uh, that uh, Michael Aquino's affiliates, of course, had been uh, administering that would uh, essentially be he would be deprived of that millions and millions of dollars worth of income. Uh, that, of course, was the source of uh, certain gang stalkers in particular, one Stuart Allison. Uh, who also uh, conveys himself as the Martian Marine. Uh, and, uh, that individual, of course, is someone who I cannot name until we get off of YouTube uh, because he and his sponsor, the multimillionaire uh, former chief executive officer of Sausage Software, uh, complain to YouTube every time their name is brought up that I'm somehow violating their privacy, even though they present themselves as public figures and uh, strive for uh, fame and public recognition and want to be celebrities is just oh so bad they can fucking taste it but they're both so uh, grotesque uh, that they lack any personal charisma both in terms of their mannerism and their appearances and uh, as a result uh, they're left in the dust well they were part of course uh, back in the day of a campaign at uh, striking back at uh, myself in any way possible and this included uh, affiliates of theirs uh, conducting mass human sacrifice by the setting of arson instigated wildfires so uh, at the time of my birthday my birthday eve day my birthday being october 20th back in 1991 uh, when I was home for a brief period of time between the time I had served in Operation Desert Storm, got my dishonorable discharge, and of course was preparing for other security contracts that would ultimately take me uh, to the Horn of Africa and ultimately into the Balkans. Uh, during the period of time I was on leave, so to speak, uh, to use a mercenary's term uh, instead of uh, applying that in a mercenary sense instead of applying that in the conventional military sense. When I was back home on my birthday, suddenly the world caught fire. Now, you might say, why Oakland instead of San Francisco? Because it was so much easier to start the fire there. And that was ultimately where I would get some of my highest paying contracts. Uh, now, interestingly enough, uh, when all of that was going down, it seemed as if the fire were originally trying to take out my workplace, certain fires that were accepted, which was uh, the site at which I worked was usually the Oakland Federal Buildings. And of course, it's a double building, uh, similar to the Twin Towers in Oakland, their, their federal building, as well as the Acorn Projects, which was in walking distance of the Oakland Federal Building, uh, the largest project site uh, in the United States, uh, quite the sprawl, 10 square city blocks, uh, 762 units, uh, but uh, instead of uh, going towards the ghetto, uh, when you make a human sacrifice, you'll find that many of these white supremacists actually go for white sacrifice. They don't prefer minorities thinking that it's uh, beneath the quality of what the anti-gods want to feast upon. They want to give their anti-gods uh, something that is, quote unquote, up to their standards or uh, what would be deemed uh, a, a high quality human sacrifice or high quality food or sustenance uh, for their anti-gods. So they usually sacrifice white people. So when it came to the generation of the Oakland wildfires, then what happened was an attack on the white community of Oakland because the security 
for the white community in the Oakland Hills was nothing like the security, say, for gated communities anywhere else in California. And that was a risk that white people took by settling in Oakland, in all black city in the first place otherwise. And uh, that was a uh, resultant in many of them uh, dying. They paid for that decision with their lives. And uh, so here we were again, 27 years ago, 1991, uh, my birthday Eve day. And uh, I took this hour long drive with a couple of friends who were into the fire sciences, majoring in such as at UC Berkeley. And uh, they wanted to see uphand for their personal uh, professional researches the Oakland firestorm of 1991. Now, to clarify, that was a large suburban wildland urban interface conflagration that occurred in the hillsides of northern Oakland, California, and southeastern Berkeley over the weekend of my birthday, uh, my solar return by the Gregorian calendar, October 19th through the 20th, the 20th being my calendrical date of birth in terms of Gregorian uh, chronology in 1991. And it was finally brought under full control on the birthday of my late and sainted sire, my father's solar return. While he was still alive at that time in 1991, my father was very much alive and very functional, very healthy. And it came under full control on his birth date, October 23rd. Now, I uh, do want uh, our uh, men Pavel to know that we've got some buffering at about every two to three minute intervals. Hopefully, everyone will withstand it, and what will happen will be they will we'll catch up and review this when uh, the full recording is uh, placed online, when it's published, uh, which should be sometime tomorrow. And uh, then, of course, um, there will probably still be buffering, but at least you'll be able to constantly replay and review uh areas that you haven't heard or haven't heard um uh, clearly uh so long as we're getting uh feedback that we are online and uh still transmitting then uh that is uh the most important thing of all uh so our dear lady ramona halitha henry has gotten an excerpt on uh, the uh fire that swept through the oakland hills that she's published on uh, my fixed link or pinned link. And uh, I believe that uh, she uh, published that on uh, actually the post she set up on my personal friends page. So she's uh, putting the links there. And uh, so I do ask everyone to go to her Showtime Live uh, post to catch up on the links that she's putting to reference or uh, provide people reference for these incidents that I uh, cite. Uh, so the official name, of the uh, fire that took place uh, from my father's birthday, uh, my birthday through my own late and sainted father's birthday. Uh, that fire, uh, its official name by Cal Fire, the organization which monitors fights, administers firefighting in the state of California. That's uh, Cal Fire is that administration. They call it the Tunnel Fire because it began in the Oakland tunnels. Uh, one of these days I'll go into the full description of that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, it was commonly referred to, always has been, uh, by everyone who is not a Cal Fire employee as the Oakland Hills Firestorm or the East Bay Hills Fire. Now that fire ultimately killed a quarter of a hundred people, 25 people died, and it injured 150 others. So in military terms, we'd say that there were 25 fatalities and 150 casualties. Uh, so in terms of all of it, it was horrific. And uh, it was a, uh, a, a, a genuine firestorm and probably the first true firestorm I ever witnessed in my entire life personally, one that turned the sky black and it was midnight at noon. Uh, the 1,520 acres, that would be 620 hectares for our European listeners, that were destroyed by that firestorm included 2,843 single-family dwellings and 437 apartment and condominium units. The economic loss from that fire was estimated at one and a half billion United States dollars, and that's in 1991 United States dollar terms. Now, I remember it personally as a revelation being there on site. Uh, and uh, I can tell you uh, what made it so bitter 
was afterwards, back in those days, what we had were called pagers. We didn't have cell phones like we do today. We had what were called pagers. And there was no way anyone other than a government agency could get text on your pager to suddenly appear. And uh, what you would get would be numbers. Pagers were not designed at that point in history to display text running. But if you were a member of the federal government for emergencies, you could use certain channels to get pagers to display text. And at that point, I received a text while I was in Oakland. And apparently, they were able to trace me by my pager exactly where I was. They knew where I was. And I got a message, a personal message from Michael Aquino saying, happy birthday, motherfucking Douglas. The fire is all for you. These people are dying because of you. And at that time, my acquaintance by my side, who has asked not to be named for his own personal security, he was researching the pyrosciences or the fire sciences and technologies at UC Berkeley. He later worked at a national laboratory that overlooks over a million acres of protected desert forest. And on June 26 of 2011, uh, the very year in which uh, my late sister Cyrus, my mother, died, uh, the wind knocked down an aspen somewhere in that national forest, toppling it into a power line and igniting a small flame. The landscape was parched. The winds were unruly. And soon that flame had become the largest wildfire in New Mexico's history. So he got to see his own personal research fire eventually uh, years later. I mean, at the time that I was at the end of my rope and nearly dead from caring for my parents uh, for over a decade. But on that day back 27 years ago, uh, on my birthday, uh, my birthday Eve day, as a matter of fact, uh, I and my friends drove around town hoping to catch a glimpse of the great Oakland blaze that had turned the sky pitch black, making it darkness at dawn. And eventually we came to a spot just below the mountains. And I remember the air outside the car reeking like an ancient brick fireplace. The fire stood a mile off and it, the flames, looked like a skyline of buildings. I could see it in the mountains above me. It was now like any bonfire or even a house fire. It was a literal, physical wall of flame, genuinely, without any exaggeration, at least 100 feet high, a phenomenon that serves as a wildfire's arrow. Now, this experience, this vision, looking into the inferno, the gaping wall of hell itself, feeling the heat on me, as if I had been thrust into an active and operating dryer turned on at its highest level, made me realize with all the oxygen sucked out of my lungs, totally unable to breathe, as if someone had stuck a vacuum cleaner in my mouth, pinched my nose shut, and turned it on full op. I realized then and there it's impossible to fight wildfires. Impossible to fight wildfires. It also changed my friend's life. He had never really seriously studied wildfires. He was just kind of toying with the major, taking a few classes, even maybe even just auditing them before he saw the Oakland wildfire. He's now a professor at a university, one of the world's leading experts on how climate change has intensified the problem of wildfire. But that fire to me personally, my birthday fire as set by Aquino's cult, the Temple of Set. What they presented to me on my birthday Eve day as my personal gift, the death of a quarter of a hundred people sacrificed to their anti-gods in vengeance for my defecting from ever becoming the heir to the Temple of Set, the Temple of the Antichrist. Fire is like an ocean. And that's the only comparison I can think of. Maybe it's due to my nautical bias because of my late and sainted father's profession as a sailor, a combat sailor throughout his life. But the fire is truly a sea of flame when it goes wild. It's so strong, we don't really stand a chance of doing much to it. When it's that big and there are helicopters dropping water and retardant on it, 
they're doing fucking nothing. When you see firefighters spraying hoses at it, that fire is so hot, they can't even be close enough to be within hose shot. They're just wetting the ground half a mile in front of it in an attempt to dampen the effect and slow it down by a matter of fucking seconds. Now California is struggling with some of the worst places in its history, but fires in the United States are getting larger and the nation is rapidly losing any ability to deal with any of them. During President Ronald Reagan's first term, the former governor of California who became president of the United States, that former actor who everybody recognized from Hollywood, so they made him president. During his administration, the federal government spent a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year fighting fires. This year alone, the Trump administration plans to spend two and a quarter billion United States dollars just battling fires. Its full budget for managing them will exceed, I can guarantee you, five billion United States dollars at the very least. It'll have to. And yet forest fire damage has ballooned nonetheless. Since the early 1980s, the land area burned by wildfires every year has increased by a thousand fucking percent. Orders of magnitude by the thousand. Now, that's impossible for most people to even begin to comprehend in terms of impact. Fires are outrunning us. We're trying harder than ever to put them out, and they're continuing to win more and more every year. When my primary gang stalker for a period of about two years, John Victor Lillier, the master sergeant from the U.S. Army Green Berets, that former Special Forces Bukaki Beret, the motherfucking faggot whose biggest thrill in life was to leave me daily messages about how he was going to rape and torture my surrogate son in front of my eyes until my son died of his sexual excesses. This individual, now dead, he ran an organization still ran by his faggot lover, Mark Seavey, called This Ain't Hell, But You Can See It From Here. Their biggest intention, their biggest objective in life, dedicating their lives to Satan, was to make hell ascend onto the surface of the earth. And they're doing it. Even though normal man, baseline humanity, isn't sparing any lack of effort in fighting their attempts to realize hell on the surface of the earth, even when we know it's been stupid policy to fight every single fire these motherfucking cultists start, we're still trying as hard as we can to do just that. We're trying to intercept every spark they ignite. And that's only going to kill us in the end, which is what they're aiming for. This is a message I wish I could drill into the head of every American, because this is war with the cults that want your soul burning in eternity as theirs will in the flames that they're igniting now that they hope will drag you down to the pit they know they will inhabit. As the California fires have dominated the news, I've been asked by friends and researchers why we can't just fix wildfires, why we can't just put them out. We solved all sorts of complex environmental engineering problems. Why not wildfires? And that question illustrates the root problem that got us into this conundrum. We think that we as humans should be able to dominate this phenomenon of wildfire. And in reality, we cannot. Even though we can put a person on the moon, even though we can create the global computer network, we can't fight wildfire. This is a natural phenomenon that is similar to the ocean that my father used to sail as a combat sailor in that it is really, really big. Global in scope, much larger than us when it really gets going. In some ways, wildfire is similar to a combustion powered hurricane. Fires put out tons of hot air at the center, which tries violently to rise. The rising air creates a vacuum at the core of fires, creating a fast-moving conveyor belt of cooler air flowing into the fire from all directions. A large fire can pull in so much air at such high speeds that its ability to do so is hindered by Earth's rotation. And it's only Earth's rotation that stops it from overrunning the entire globe. 
In the northern hemisphere, a large wildfire smoke column will begin to spin counterclockwise, seen from space, just as happens to hurricanes. And sometimes that channel of upward flowing air can collapse in one small spot. Then the hot air in the atmosphere plummets through the weak point. You get a very fast wind moving down towards the ground, and when it hits the ground, it spreads like jelly slopping across the floor. It can also send white hot air out in front of the flame, incinerating the landscape before the actual flame has even arrived. It can cause forests to spontaneously combust without coming into any contact with a single flame. Now, how do I know so much about this? Because as a Department of Defense research librarian, I was doing research at the behest of military officers concerning how the Japanese won World War II, which everyone in the highest levels of military command in the United States knows for a fact. And one of the ways they won it was by generating firestorms in the Pacific Northwest in World War II as the precursor to unleashing biocidal weapons based on the air currents that they mapped based on the smoke generated by the forest fires that they incepted via the world's first intercontinental guided missiles, the ICUBs, the intercontinental unguided bombs. And these ICUBs, these ICUBs weren't unguided at all. They were guided by the jet stream, which only goes from Japan towards the United States. So the Americans could never do something back at the Japanese based on any similar technology. All of nature operated on behalf of the Japanese who had an emperor who was a marine biologist and knew about the jet stream as the Kuroshiwa, the black current that ran from Japan only towards North America and never the other way around. Now, all of this was studied by me to the point where I was consulted by experts and researchers on the phenomenon of wildfire during my career as a Department of Defense research librarian, and I'm still unofficially contacted even today. So when I described how these combustion-powered hurricanes form out of wildfire. When this upward-moving air pattern stays strong, it creates other kinds of problems. It can loft burning wood high into the atmosphere, carrying it many miles away from the center of the fire to generate other fires. When this debris finally lands, it spreads the fires miles away spontaneously as if another balloon bomb had exploded. Now, in 1991, with the Oakland fires going on across the bay, across the Oakland Bay Bridge, the joke, of course, being that the Oakland Bay Bridge is the longest bridge in the world because it bridges Africa and Fairyland, Oakland and San Francisco. Here I was across the Oakland Bay when I returned home after that experience of seeing that wall of flame. I myself lived dozens of miles from the edge of the blaze on Russian Hill in San Francisco, yet I distinctly remember the experience of semi-burned sticks falling like drizzle in my backyard. These were twigs I could hold in my hand and say, wow, this actually weighs something. And it made it 35 miles in the air across the bay. Now, I'm being told by Ramona Halitha Henry that the sound is gone, asking if anyone else can hear me. And I uh, do hope others can. If not, hopefully we are recording. Uh, certainly, this will probably be a problem throughout the night. Now, when the fires are really moving like that, now someone might be trying to talk to me. Maybe it's uh, Pavel coming on bandwidth. He uh, might be saying something, or maybe I... Yeah. So what's up, Pavel? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. So um, the only person who can hear Pavel is myself. Uh, I assure you, I'm not talking to voices in my head, though with Pavel Edward uh, being the only one, only heard by myself, it's the equivalent thereof. 
he assures me that I must move forward, that essentially uh, we've had Skype drop off several times, but uh, it's this problem of Skype itself uh, as opposed to our ability to uh, maintain bandwidth in live stream. So uh, that's it. Lots of buffering more often, but altogether uh, we seem to be in as best a shape as we can be, uh, considering everything else that we're dealing with in terms of a uh, uh, technological mishap and uh, the conditions that we have uh, concerning all of uh, the difficulties we had to face and overcome in order to get online at all. So as I said, uh, these uh, sticks raining from the sky, uh, some of them on fire, uh, some of them weighing enough to kill a man if they landed on his head. When the fires are really moving like that, it's because the meteorological conditions are allowing that to happen. And I myself estimate that the California wildfires will not be fully contained until the winter rains arrive. So how should Americans react to the power of forest fires? By respecting them and by understanding that we are in a new era of great fires, the concept of a burning America that Michael Aquino once envisioned is being realized. The continuing increase in fire is an inevitability, particularly in the Western United States. It's an inevitability that this trend is going to continue. If the public were to understand this, then they would become more tolerant of managerial tactics that are currently seen as either too risky or too heartless. Something akin, if I could use an analogy with the fictional novel World War Z, written by Max Brooks's, uh, excuse me, Mel Brooks's son, Max Brooks, a former uh, ROTC, our reserve officer training cadet, uh, who I personally met and have spoken to, he conceived in that novel of a ruthless tactic of abandoning entire families to the undead hordes uh, in order to deal with the phenomenon from a strategic level rather than answering the endless and infinite familial emergencies of individual small groups or nuclear families or groups of people that were lost behind the overwhelming wave. That's the kind of attitude we're going to have to assume towards the firestorms generated by the anti-godly worshiping cults of the Temple of Set and their affiliates. Now, many forest managers know that a certain tract of woodland is due for a catastrophic wildfire in the next decade, but they feel they have no political ability to do a controlled burn there, lest it get out of control. If the public understood that huge swaths of western forests will soon burn, they may be more willing to allow controlled burns when the meteorological conditions be right. Today, it's completely impossible to say that we need to have a 100,000 acre fire in that forest. Any politician or fire manager who brought that up, it would be a death wish for their career. That's going to have to change. I don't have a career in that particular field, so I can say it with impunity. Now, as for firefighting in the future, this is important because the best way to deal with these conflagrations, to prevent them from taking our cities down, is prevention. And that's going to be based on technology. And it's going to be through sensors. That's going to bring us back to the sensors that expose the cause of the campfire that's directly impacting my health and everyone else's in the greater San Francisco Bay Area Metroplex region today. In 1666, the original year of Satan, when the prototypical Church of the Antichrist was established in the year 1666, 1666, by the original Magus, who was the ultimate forebearer and inspiration for the latter day black pope of the first church of satan the magus anton zandor levey who established his church of satan in san francisco california right outside the presidio military base on arguello street right outside the arguello gate of the san francisco el presidio real de san francisco all of this 
precursor to the reign of Anton Zandor LeVay was prophesied back in 1666 of the Gregorian calendar. That's when the Great Fire of London was set by the Hellfire Club of England that ripped through that city, the capital of British Empire, and in that sense, very much almost the capital of the world. It destroyed 70,000 homes, killed so many people, I don't believe there's ever been an accurate count. And still today, fire stands as one of the greatest threats to human life. So much so that an entire profession has grown around protecting us from it, as well as an entire science in the study of technology by which to fight it. Firefighters do an essential job, and they do it with impressive efficiency. But there is and always has been a fatal weakness in the way they operate. They're entirely reliant on citizens reporting fires, meaning they can only get to work after a report comes in, after the fact, when it's too fucking late. And people are already destined to die. This reliance on the city's residents to be the eyes and ears on the ground creates a window of risk where the fire can cause significant destruction and loss of life before fires have even been made aware of it. Future technology, therefore, has a problem to solve. Stop fire in its track as quickly as possible before any damage even be caused. This challenge will be met through the development of citywide sensory networks designed to monitor minute temperature changes across the urban landscape. A whole labyrinth of sensors will be installed along city streets to cover the city like an invisible web, each one providing vital early warning signals to produce the quickest possible response time from the emergency services. Of course, this technology will continue to evolve as the sensors move into new buildings and are retrofitted into the city's current buildings to provide another layer of depth and accuracy. With such a system in place, a fire breaking out in any location of the city will be detected within seconds, allowing firefighters to immediately dispatch, greatly reducing the risk of human life. Finally, the further stage of the process has the potential to make the idea of someone dying in a fire as antiquated as the idea of someone dying from smallpox. Alongside this citywide sensory network will come the construction of drone pipelines running under every street. In this world that I envision, in my combating the satanic cultists who want to make hell something you can see from here and actually experience here on the surface world. In the world I envision, human firefighters will no longer be relied upon as firefighting drones take their place. Upon detection of a fire, the central city computer will analyze the situation and dispatch the appropriate number of drones. These will then arrive with unimaginable speed as they make use of the purpose-built underground pipes. Upon their emergence onto the surface, they will establish a connection with the nearest street-level water pipe and scuttle their way to the area of concern to extinguish the flames. With such a system, it's hard to imagine how fire could ever be allowed to wreak the kind of destruction it does today, threatening the city I live in. One of the areas which was envisioned in turn by Jerry Anderson, excuse me, I always confuse him with Gene Roddenberry, Jerry Anderson being the English equivalent thereof. But Gene Roddenberry, who developed the Star Trek franchise, envisioned Starfleet Academy to be headquartered in the successor state to the Presidio military base in San Francisco, seceding the U.S. Army Six Army headquarters as Starfleet Command, basically administering the universe or the known galaxy as occupied by mankind or humanity in a far brighter future for that almost 1,500 acres of satanic wasteland as established by the former United States Army in the dark days of the 20th century and prior. In Gene Roddenberry's universe, the Presidio was turned towards the good of humanity and the city of San Francisco, the de facto capital of the human galaxy. In that universe, of course, we have something that Gene Roddenberry never had to envision, the threat of constant wildfire not having to be dealt with. In my reality, I definitely envision a situation which combines 
what he proposed with what I'm proposing right now. So through technology, we will succeed in creating an urban environment far safer than anything possible today. But for now, the worst is yet to come for California's wildfires. Even insurance companies no blazes will be bigger in just a few decades, bigger even than what we see now. And I ask you now, how many people have to die before we impose on the cities of the United States my prospectus of the drone pipes fire combat system? Firefighters are even now warring with blazes up and down my state of California. In the north, where I'm situated, the so-called campfire has become the deadliest, largest, and most destructive fire in state history. In its trail of ash stand the smoldering ruins of Paradise, California, an entire city of 26,000 people until this very week. The campfire got its jolly name by a fluke. Most Western wildfires are named after the place they started, and the campfire began on Camp Creek Road. Most of its growth came on its first day, when it devoured over 70,000 acres, or 109 square miles, in 24 hours. At that rate, the fire consumed a football field of forest every single second. The numbers these fires are capable of posting are mind-boggling. The raging campfire burned through the town of Paradise in Northern California and raced toward the city of Chico. As of now, the wildfire has consumed some 150,000 acres, while the air quality is an ongoing health problem impacting millions in California, the death toll from the actual campfire itself producing the smoke has more pertinently generated a lethality index climbing to at least 76 fatalities only as so far thus accounted for, with nearly 1,300 people missing and unaccounted for, all possibly dead, in addition to destroying 10,000 homes. This be the deadliest and most destructive wildfire in state history. It has already broken a record set in 1933 when Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president that year when a brush fire in Los Angeles killed 29 people. And still, the campfire's death toll is expected to rise. And as unreal as these losses are, a grim reality has been setting in for former residents of Paradise. For the people who survived the campfire that engulfed the town of Paradise, life as they knew it is gone forever. In its place, a state of limbo. Thousands are now homeless with no town to go back to. The campfire is still only 60% contained as last approximated to my own knowledge and it still threatens the edge of Chico, the largest city in Butte County, California. Yet is there, the legions of paradise evacuees are swelling shelters and a makeshift tent city in nearby Chico. Some sleep in their trucks, others in a tent city outside a Walmart Chico, and still more in evacuation centers, which have become breeding grounds for disease. It's medieval. We're back to the Middle Ages many praying that family members or friends will be found, and so many loved ones and neighbors are still missing. For many residents of the Sierra foothills, small woodsy spots like Paradise, Megalia, and tiny Concow were a refuge from the world. They came to retire, to get away from the city, to change their lives. Now they're living in limbo and remembering the dead. Now, for police patrolling Paradise, it's surreal. They say there's really no one to watch over. And yet still, last Thursday, law enforcement officers were forced to fatally shoot and kill a Barry Creek man following a pursuit in a campfire evacuation zone. The man, identified as 48-year-old G.D. Hendricks, was a suspect in a 2014 double homicide investigation in Butte County, and he was wanted by the authorities after skipping on his parole in a separate matter taking advantage of the campfire to try and lose himself in the mass evacuation, the mass exodus of fleeing humanity. In the South, firefighters are battling the Woolsey Fire, 
which has grown with the help of hot, howling Santa Ana winds. That fire has killed at least two people I know of and devoured over 85,000 acres, so far as I know by this point, destroying buildings across Ventura County. It's only 78% contained, as I know last, and the Santa Anas were expected to pick up again this afternoon. The same winds having worsened last year's fires as well. Brian Rice, who I've sourced before and will source again this transmission, the president of the California Professional Firefighters, said, right now families are in mourning, thousands have lost homes, and a quarter million Americans have been forced to flee. I quote his T as he was responding to comments from President Donald Trump, who threatened to withhold disaster relief for this state because of its quote unquote gross mismanagement of the forests, even though Trump's own appointed advisors have informed him of the fact that the overwhelming majority of timberland in California is directly under his own control. It's under federal administration, meaning any fuck ups that have taken place with mismanagement are Donald Trump's, not California, because our state manages only 3% of the forest land within our borders. The rest is either private property and overwhelmingly federal parkland. That Woolsey fire down south has prompted the evacuation of Thousand Oaks, the same city menaced by a mass shooting on Wednesday of last week that left 12 people dead. Yet still, at a memorial, thousands gathered in direct threat of the approaching flames to pay tribute to Ventura County Sheriff Sergeant Ron Hellis, who was killed in the shooting at the borderline bar and grill in Thousand Oaks last week when he threw himself in front of that fucking filthy Marine as a human meat shield before many other people who would have died had he had not done so. That brings us to the concept of short-term memory because I don't want his heroism to be forgotten. I don't want that massacre to be forgotten. Bad news gets overshadowed by more bad news. And on no subject is that punishing pattern clearer than when the news is about mass shootings. How long do such stories even dominate headlines? That time span has stayed remarkably consistent over the past several decades. So this is some education for you. The media's week-long attention span for a mass shooting. There's a common refrain that the dense news environment pushes out coverage of mass shootings, but the cycle has been remarkably consistent over the past 20 years. Let us set most recent precedents. A gunman walked into a bar in Thousand Oaks, California, and opened fire Last Wednesday night, or the week before, I'm losing track of my weeks here. So if it wasn't the Wednesday of last week, it was the Wednesday of the week before I By the time the gunfire had stopped, because of this former Marine out to hit target blue, blue on blue in fighting, friendly fire from fellow Marines, the largest cause of death for any American serviceman is friendly fire. Far more Americans in this day and age die from friendly fire than they do from fire from the enemy. And he brought that war home. And when he took out a fellow former Marine, basically by the time his gunfire had stopped, 13 people, including the shooter himself, though I don't count him as people, were dead. It was one tragedy among many in recent weeks, including a shooting at a yoga studio where some misogynist white trash piece of shit killed a number of women to prove his point that men rule. And then, of course, there was the massacre at a synagogue in Pittsburgh, all within a fortnight, 14 nights or a two-week period. Media coverage of these events tends to follow a similar script. For Erica Good, surname spelled G-O-O-D-E, a visiting professor at Syracuse University's Newhouse School of Public Communications, she says, you do the day story, and then you do the victim story, and then you profile the shooter. By the next week, in most cases, the news cycle has moved on. A review of dozens of New York Times front pages in the days immediately after 10 of the deadliest mass shootings since Columbine found that the script is remarkably consistent, almost pre-writ. Most of the shootings carried the front page for six days, including the Sunday edition, 
According to a report from Media Matters for America, cable news coverage, which tends to cycle through news events even faster, charts a similar course. That report found that after the deadliest mass shooting in modern American history in Las Vegas, major news coverage of the attack lasted but a single week. And that consistency is but a reflection of a dense news environment with more major stories nearly every day than can possibly fit on a front page. The extent of coverage is not solely determined by the number of fatalities. The Thousand Oaks shooting, for example, was only on the front page of the Times for one single day, a single 24-hour cycle, as it was pushed off immediately by the deadliest fires in California history, some of which, it so happened, were also in Thousand Oaks. And there are outliers at the other end of the spectrum as well. After a gunman killed 17 people at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, stories about that shooting were on the front page of the Times for 16 consecutive days. That's in large part due to the student-led activism that emerged in the wake of the shooting, calling for stronger firearm safety regulations. As the New York Times editorial writer Michelle Cottle put it, possessed of that blend of innocence and savvy peculiar to teenagers, the Stoneman Douglas survivors indeed have emerged as a rare, perhaps even unique, voice in the gun debate. They're old enough to advocate for themselves, yet young enough to still embody a certain innocence, to retain a certain idealism about how the world should be. Now, we're at the top of the hour. I'm going to maybe take a small break, but it's only be going to be for a breath and a sip of tea. I will probably won't even take a break. There's no point because we're not installing ads. So since we're not injecting any ads, I'm just going to barrel on straight through, make it easier for Pavel Edwards so he doesn't get tempted to stuff in any buffer music, uh, which uh, I'm still convinced uh, did a job on us or a number on us last transmission. Uh, so we'll just barrel on ahead. Now, I lost a friendship on the basis of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High shooting, and that was based on Abdul Qadim Haq, uh, who was convinced, of course, by the white trash alternative media as a colored coon himself, that these were all crisis actors and that none of them were innocent and they were far more guilty than any mass shooter, and they all wanted to come and take our firearms away. Now, that, of course, was an individual, Abdul Karim Haq, who took his own kids out of school at a very young age. We're talking about the age of something like uh, like 12 or, or 14. Uh, his daughter uh, being in honors at the Hamtronic Muslim uh, school and uh, his son going to the same Muslim school in Hamtronic, one of the finer schools, just as Catholic schools are in quality, just so he could save $600 a month on car insurance and gas money and be able to get up at whatever hour he wanted after smoking dope all night to wake and bake again in the morning. I don't say that to paint him in a bad light. That's exactly what he does. He's in a bad light by dint of what he is. That's the kind of person who doesn't value his own children, who destroys their future. That's the kind of person who believes all these kids at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High were crisis actors. That's the kind of trash that would buy into a conspiracy theory about a mass shooting. Now, Professor Good, a communications expert who studies this phenomenon of miscommunications, disinformation, she noted the difference in Parkland as well as that New York Times editorial writer, Michelle Connell, put it. She also noticed something else. Professor Good noted the media had, by and large, started to change at that point in history how it covered the shootings. Good at that time worked as a reporter and editor at the New York Times herself for about 18 years, almost two decades, and she had covered several mass shootings herself. After Parkland, she observed that one of the regular story genres, the shooter profile, had gotten shorter. And in some news outlets, it wasn't there at all. Now, this is a particularly important development because. She says, Professor Good does, of reporters covering mass shootings throughout her career, 
She says what we told people was that shooter profiles would help people understand what causes this and who these people are. However, she said she later decided that's bullshit. Far from introducing anything particularly revelatory about the shooters, these stories brand the perpetrators as mysterious lone wolves, something that carries a whiff of coolness or allure. In other words, it promotes mystique. So now she concludes that a profile of the shooter is not going to help anybody understand who these people are. Instead, it's going to draw attention to shooters from people who are fascinated by reading about them. It's going to make them famous, basically. It's going to reward their mass murder. Those stories have been replaced, at least in print, by stories, both local and national, on firearm safety regulations reforms and more stories about the victims. Of course, Professor Good says it is news organizations' duty, by definition, to cover the news, and the identity of the shooter is news, by definition. But she's also said it's imperative to cover the news responsibly. By giving less of a platform to shooters and focusing more on the victims of the shooting and on solutions to potentially prevent the next one from happening, oftentimes regulatory in their nature, Media organizations might beat back some of the likelihood of another shooting, so she believes. us. Now, the phenomenon Good's talking about is known colloquially as a copycat effect. That I got from my old days at the City College of San Francisco when I majored in criminal psychology, a double major in criminology and psychology, that according to my gang stalker, who was once CEO of Sausage Software, doesn't exist. Now, City College of San Francisco has always had a criminology course. Its instructors first taught the Magus Anton Zandor LaVey, the black pope of the first church of Satan, about criminology. That's how he avoided the Korean War era draft, by becoming a forensics photographer for the San Francisco Police Department after taking criminology courses at San Francisco City College. Those same instructors aged by decades were just in their last semester prior retirement when they taught Douglas Dietrich the photography techniques of forensics that I used to smuggle photographs out of the Presidio military base, some of which you see in my presentation, Satan's Crusaders. So I can tell you about the copycat effect, educated as I am in this area, and it's today referenced not by that cutesy nomenclature or shall we say uh, terminology. It's referenced by researchers who study it as a contagion. The idea that more media coverage of mass shootings might lead those inclined to commit atrocities to actually do so. Researchers at Arizona State University led by Sherry Towers, a research professor at that institution, set out to uncover whether or not such a effect existed. For Towers, it was a personal endeavor. In 2014, Towers was headed to Purdue University in Indiana to meet with her collaborators on a research project when suddenly the meeting was canceled. A teaching assistant at Purdue University had walked into a classroom and killed another teaching assistant. Towers, who has a background in modeling contagious processes, specifically diseases, has since asserted that it occurred to me that day that that was the third school shooting I'd heard about in a 10-day period. And it made me wonder if perhaps there was a contagion effect maybe playing a role. That insanity spreads like a disease. Ultimately, researchers have found that in high-profile mass shootings, there be a statistically significant contagion effect. Towers has since posited, we hypothesize that perhaps widespread media attention plays a role in actually basically informing people who might be at risk of committing one of these acts. Lately, there's been a refrain that the increasing pace of the news cycle, especially under Donald Trump and his insanity, along the frequency of mass shootings that have propagated as a mass contagion under the dictatorship of Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin's Russian puppet president, all to kill as many Americans as possible and keep them in a state of constant fear, 
All this means that tragedies are not covered as vigorously as they once were. There's simply no time. There's too many of them. In some cases, as with Thousand Oaks, the pace of the news cycle does push the stories off the front page immediately. But in most cases, they're still covered as they've always been for a period of a week. What has changed isn't the length of the coverage, but the substance. And most experts, criminal psychologists like myself, would say that's for the better. Now, like a mass shooter, California's worst fire has preyed on those who cannot run. People sick in bed, those listening for updates on the radio. They were frantic to save their pets, put necessities in their cars and drive off. Many haven't made it. All of that brings me to trying to describe to you from a more personal level, this deadly tsunami of fire. I've used these nautical terms because of my late and sainted father, and I'm going to continue to use them in honor of George Joseph Henry Dietrich, the combat sailor who gave me a nautical grip on the world of flame. California's campfire is still not contained, and the number of dead is still rising. The statistics as I understand them at this very minute are 76 people dead, at least 1,276 be missing, possibly all dead. And over 7 million people have been confined to their homes under house arrest for all intents and purposes as a cloud of toxic, corrosive ash darkens our windows and creeps under our doors. The campfire, which still blazes across some 232 square miles of Northern California outside San Francisco, now ranks among the worst natural disasters to hit the United States this century. Only a handful of hurricanes and a super outbreak of tornadoes in 2011, the year my late and sainted Cyrus, my mother Diana Dietrich died, have killed more Americans. This fire has robbed more Californians of their lives than has any earthquake since Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president of the United States in 1933. And it came like an ocean of flame. At 6.33 a.m. on Thursday, November 8th, someone called 911 about a fire in the woods on Camp Creek Road, that same road that would land its fire, its bitterly ironic name. When firefighters arrived 10 minutes later, just 10 minutes later, they noted the parched conditions and the harsh hot wind. One said, even then, over the radio, this has got the potential for a major incident. And for the next 24 hours, the campfire devoured, as I've stated, roughly a football field of forest every fucking second. By 11 a.m., it grew to 1,000 acres. By high noon, its ash cloud blocked out the sun. By 1 p.m., the plume was visible from space, a gray blot smearing across the green of California. That morning, the 26,000 residents of Paradise began to evacuate but the fire moved too fast. It consumed homes before their occupants could flee and devoured cars while they sat on the road out of town with entire families screaming in them as they burned alive. Later authorities revealed that in the pandemonium, bulldozers cleared torch cars off the highway with bodies inside them so that the cars behind them with living people could escape. Within hours, paradise was gone. When Californians woke up on Friday, November 9th, they learned that the campfire had devoured 70,000 acres of land. Nine days later, it flickered across some 150,000 acres and was then only 55% contained. There'd be no disaster like a wildfire. Earthquakes can strike at any time, but they only last for a few moments. Hurricanes might rage for days, but they can be forecast ahead of time. Fire might most closely resemble, as my late and sainted father, the combat sailor, would say, a tsunami. It arrives like an ocean you can't outrun, except that fires also choke every city downwind with poisonous billows of ash. It's come to resemble an ocean in its scale, too. The campfire's smoky air now envelops millions of people from the state's desert like south to its evergreen crown north. The ash fills the state's central valley like water in a bathtub with the Golden Gate of San Francisco as the main plug where it can all rush out. 
And perhaps the worst aspect here is this will all happen again and again. The science on climate change and wildfires is very clear, much, much clearer than on many other topics, including hurricanes. Scientists know with the conviction of religious certainty that scorching hot summers dry out the needles and twigs on the forest floor, turning them into a tinderbox. They know that climate change has doubled the area that forest fires have burned since 1984, that great Orwellian year. They know that a century of putting out fires in forests that are evolved to burn regularly has crammed the timberlands full of burnable fuel. And finally, scientists know that California's tendency to lurch from a big dry year to a big wet year is intensifying. It's feast famine cycle getting more pronounced, like something out of Game of Thrones where seasons last for years at a time. They know this will make fires worse. It will allow more plant matter to grow during the wet years, which during the dry years will dry out and die and become fire fuel. 76 people thus far, trapped in their homes, fleeing in their cars, now lost forever. And the science is clear, far more than in hurricanes, far more than in droughts, Humanity played a role in this. Not just the arsonists, not just the cultists, but all of us, through the negligence of spewing carbon into the air, through the hubris of trying to suppress fires. We have toyed with fire, thinking it our tool. As I said, every animal has its element. Birds have the skies, the fish have the seas. Man's element is fire. We've toyed with it to the point where we've produced atomic fire, generated nuclear bombs and thermonuclear heat, thinking it our tool. But the campfire outside the gates of my city, burning at this moment and threatening San Francisco, reminds us all that we as human beings are the element of fire's plaything. Authorities in Northern California on Friday last week urgently searched for those who perished and those who survived the fiercest of wildfires ahead of a planned visit by President Donald Trump. But officials say it could take weeks to complete the search for victims of the worst wildfire in California history. An unrelenting job for the case coroner, Kim Jin, who says, I've been here 19 years and we haven't had anything close to this. I'll try and relate what I can of her professional experience. To identify campfire remains, Sacramento coroner Kim Jin sent or dispatched from the capital of the Golden Bear Republic of California itself. She faces around the clock challenges. As victims from the devastating campfire in Butte County are recovered by search teams, the remains are loaded into body bags, then taken by Harris to refrigerated trucks. Then they're driven 90 miles south to Sacramento, the capital of this state, where Coroner Kim Jin's staff is facing the biggest challenge she has ever seen in her time in office throughout her entire career of decades. Thursday of last week, as her staff worked alongside coroner's officials who have streamed in from other offices around the state, Jin said, this is not normal. I've been here 19 years and we haven't had anything even close to this. I think the most we ever had was maybe five victims and that's easily managed. This is what we train for all the time and prepare for, but until you get in it, you don't know how it really is. With a staff of 32 people and a large morgue, the capital of California, Sacramento, is a natural choice to help with the laborious task of identifying dozens of fire victims in various conditions, from bodies to little more than ash and fragments of bone. Butte County had some facilities that were damaged in the fire, didn't have the capacity to handle the number of bodies that had been recovered as of Thursday last week. Twas then already 56 and counting, over half a hundred. Jin's office dispatched officials to Butte County starting last Friday to retrieve bodies and bring them back in coroner's vehicles to the facility on Broadway, Sacramento, the city thereof, where pathologists, dioxyribonucleic acid experts, DNA experts, and others have been conducting the examinations to formally identify the victims before they might be returned to Butte County officials to be released to family members. To quote us, Jin, we're the closest city that actually has a sizable morgue. We have plenty of room. We're not using our trailers right now, but I have a semi-trailer that's refrigerated. 
and we have a refrigerated truck that's being used to transport back and forth. Because some remains are nothing more than bones or teeth, the coroner's office is using various methods to identify the victims. Now, sourcing gin again, she says, we're doing a bunch of things. Some people can be identified through fingerprints, and that can be done really quickly. Some are being identified through forensic dentistry, and some will be through dioxyribonucleic acid because there's almost nothing left that would be identifiable to the human eye. There are a lot of different types of scientific fields that are all involved in all of this. Anthropologists, dioxyribonucleic experts, pathologists, relatives of victims from as far away as Minnesota are being asked to provide DNA samples to their local law enforcement agencies to be compared to the bodies brought to Sacramento. On Thursday morning, Sol Bechtolt and his wife drove from their Pleasanton home in California to the Butte County Sheriff's Office in Oroville to provide a sample he hopes will determine whether his mother perished in the fire. Bechtolt's been watching the sheriff's evening briefings each night, anxiously waiting for news about his mother, Joan Caddy, a 35-year resident of Magalia. When he heard the department would begin accepting DNA samples, he knew what he had to do. He said, I decided, you know what, I'm not going to wait. I need to go. I need an answer one way or another. Now, Bechtold hadn't heard from a coroner or a detective about whether remains were found near his mother's house, but a Sacramento newspaper team from the Sacramento Bee saw human remains being recovered Thursday by searchers at Caddy's address. Bechtold had the inside of his cheek swabbed for both the rapid DNA testing system known as ANDE, A-N-D-E, and for the state coroner office's DNA database, which he was told would be used if the faster system couldn't determine a match. Now, of course, this was before my time that I took forensics courses at City College of San Francisco. So the acronym ANDE is something that I've tried to determine uh, what that stood for medically. I think it is something that has to do with rapid DNA, of course, that uh, theoretically will bring us a safer world. I still haven't found uh, what the acronym actually means as of the time that I've gone on transmission. I'll count on a friendly uh, fellow or lady to uh, enter that into communications for me. In the meantime, officials that are at the makeshift testing facility in the lobby of the sheriff's department down in Butte County have asked every bit of information from Bechtold, the person whose case I'm sourcing, to give you an example of what's going down with individuals in California. And they asked him for every bit of information about his mother down to broken bones and whether she had a replacement knee. Details, all that would prove helpful. So Bechtold got to the lobby just before 8 a.m. in the morning because he expected it to be standing room only. By the time he left, there were a dozen people giving DNA samples on site. And, of course, he said it's horrible, horrible situation. The fact that my mother could not be with me any longer here is heartbreaking. But to have an answer one way or another to bring closure would be huge. I'll break down and cry later. But to have an answer, he just kept repeating himself, would be huge. That's how I remember his commentary publicly. Now, in terms of uh, Butte County Sheriff Corey Hone, I believe he's of Hawaiian descent. He said Wednesday night of last week that 47 of the 56 victims recovered as of then had been tentatively identified, but that he was waiting for final results before releasing any names. Only three victims have been officially identified, although family members of various victims have come forward to confirm that they've been told their relatives have died in the fire. Searchers continue to find human remains inside the fire zone, and hundreds of people remain listed as missing. But Coroner Jin said the pace at the coroner's office has slowed somewhat since the initial crush of victims being brought in. She issued this statement that we were going round the clock at first, but we're not doing so any longer. So to give you another example of the survivors as opposed to the fatalities of this California fire, think about when the fire is coming fast and help is not. If you stay, you're dead. Now, I spent over 10 years of my life, about a decade and a year, 11 years, in my third career in human existence, first as a Department of Research, uh, Defense Research Librarian, then as a 
mercenary security enforcement agent. And I'm going to be speaking about some of those in this transmission and their responsibilities in this inferno. And then I spent time as a care provider and a senior care advocate for my late and sainted parents. That was the worst job of all. And that literally, literally was worse than death. I shouldn't even be alive today on the basis of that career alone and the stresses suffered therein. Far more so than anything that took me out transitionally in the other careers I had. And in terms of that career, there were periods of time when I had to look for places to have my play parents located, cited for a period of months just so I could get a break and some sleep. So I'm very familiar with the nursing home communities in California. I had to be statewide because in the greater Bay Area of San Francisco alone, many of the nursing homes or places which are care facilities for the elderly, senior care homes are subpar beneath any standards that are acceptable. One of the places where I had to place either one of my parents for a few weeks at a time, just so I could have concentration on the other parent outside of the facility in terms of care provision in totality because of their life-threatening situation being such that I had to devote all 100% of my attention to them 24 hours around the clock. In order to do that, I had to install another parent in a care facility for a period of up to weeks at a time. I grew very familiar with the best of the best. One of the places with the help of my gang affiliate, Beaver, that I had my parents driven to for such periods of time where one of them was installed in such a facility, sequestered there while I took care of the other. One of those places was Cypress Meadows Post-Acute Skilled Nursing Facility. So I had my contacts there and they were a paradise nursing home that had to be evacuated. How do you evacuate a nursing home when the deadliest wildfire in California history is bearing down and you have 91 men and women to get to safety. Most can't power themselves. Some have senile dementia. And a few of them weigh well over 300 pounds. The fire's coming. If you stay, you're dead. How do you evacuate a nursing home under those conditions with patients in need of walkers or wheelchairs? or confined to the hospital beds, suffering from Kreutzfeldt Jacobs, prion disease, Alzheimer's, recovering from strokes, with the fire coming in fast, well, help is not. Staying at the Cypress Meadows Post-Acute Center in Paradise wasn't an option. Sheltering in place meant certain death for the 30 or so staff members on hand and the patients who relied on them. A fleet of vans that might have helped ferry them to safety had been turned back because of the danger. Sheila Kraft, the Director of Admissions and Marketing at Cypress Meadows, had to find 91 beds within driving distance of this small town in the Sierra foothills. And at that time, she had to find them now. Now, on a typical day, there's waiting lists to get a bed at a skilled nursing home or a memory care center or assisted living facility. And this was no typical day. The fire started about 6.30 a.m. November 8th, as I had said, about eight miles of rugged terrain away from the nursing home. Crafts had herself seen smoke an hour earlier whilst driving her four kids to school in this woodsy town where all of them were born. She spotted flames in the distance as she headed toward Cypress Meadows, by 7.45 a.m., she was at her desk working the phones. To quote to she herself, she said, I was calling every facility around. Hey, we're getting evacuated. This is happening. I don't know if you've watched the news, but how many beds do you have available? 
So they'd tell her four females and two males. She'd say, okay, I'm putting you down. I'll take them. Then she would call another facility. How many beds do you have available? So she got one phone in this ear calling, finding residents homes beds, the other phone in this ear with her 12 year old seventh grader standing in front of her gym with a plume of smoke going, mom, I have to be picked up. We're being evacuated. I'm okay. I'm going to get somebody to get you. You stay right there. Don't move. By the time Olivia Drummond arrived at work at 8 a.m., Cypress Meadows was in full evacuation mode, a process that's fraught even for the able-bodied gathering their own things and their own loved ones and leaving their own homes under their own steam. And the fire was only growing. The medical records director bagged each patient's documents, paperwork that described who they were, how to reach their next of kin, what drugs they should take, the care they all wanted when they were dying. A medication nurse bagged each one's drugs, a certified nursing assistant put together changes of clothes. Patients were all dressed and seated in wheelchairs, bags with their drugs and clothes and paperwork tied to the chair handles. Now, according to Drummond, Cypress Meadows, director of social services, she said, we pulled them out of the rooms. Our plan was to get the rooms emptied and close the door. Once the door was closed, we knew there was no resident in there. That way, no one would be left behind as flames licked the rafters and made their way through the nursing home's wings. The first 40 patients, the most ambulatory and easiest to move, headed out about 9.30 a.m. Then came an order to shelter in place. Patients who had been quayed up in wheelchairs outside were rolled back into the dining area, away from the growing toxic smoke. Just before 10 a.m., authorities arrived to declare, you got to go. Staff members lined up their cars to ferry patients out. The wheelchairs were abandoned. Drummond helped her daughter, Sarah, a dietary technician at that very home, load two patients into her forward focus. Sarah's 19 years old. The last thing Drummond's husband told her was, don't separate from Sarah. But on that terrible Thursday morning, she had no choice. Now, Drummond is four and a half months pregnant. She planned to take the passenger seat, but one of the patients needed it so because she didn't fit in back. And Drummond couldn't squeeze in either, being swollen with child. So she sent the car down the hill. Sarah wouldn't be heard from for the next 10 hours. Her parents wouldn't even know if she and her passengers made it out alive. Kraft pulled her white Chevrolet Suburban to the Cypress Meadows entrance. She's not a nurse, so she drove patients who didn't need complicated care, two women and a man, one stroke victim, two with Alzheimer's disease. They were headed to Roseleaf, a memory care facility in Chico, about 16 miles away, a 30-minute drive when the world's not on fire. But on this day, when the world was ablaze, it took nearly seven hours. Kraft pulled into gridlock, headed south. She considered piloting her truck down a bike path and through a trailer park, but the bike path was on fire. She saw there weren't no cars in a northbound lane, so she took it heading south and then came upon flames at an intersection. Ahead of her was a line of stopped cars. To the left was a tall tree on fire, an entire hospital's medical buildings ablaze, a flaminato. A fire tornado sweeping by along the driver's side of a suburban. She was on the phone with her husband. She knew then that she and everyone around her was going to die. And she related that the side of her car was hot. There was fire right there. She was sick to her stomach. She's never been so scared. She kept telling her husband goodbye. And he was with her kids, and he kept saying, no, no, no. And he said that he fell to his knees praying for an angel to come, that somebody would come and help her get them out of there. And uh, when I heard this personally from some of these survivors, I think about if my parents had been there and how I would have had to have been called into all of this, and uh, my parents having been in that facility, I knew the very wings that were burning even as these experiences were going on for the people evacuating. Now, six days have passed since fires destroyed their hometown. I can't even imagine how it hurts them. So she just told her husband that she didn't think that um, 
there was going to be a delivery that she couldn't walk her way out of this. She couldn't make this go away. She couldn't get out. And so he said, you do what you have to do. You have to drive around people. You drive people around. You get off that hill. Jumped a curb, making some headway, jumped another, popped a tire, pulled into the parking lot of the local Safeway, couldn't find any jack to change the tire. And then this little electric powered Ford pulled up, a car that her husband and herself would never own in a, as she puts it, gazillion million years. And behind the wheel was some guy named Nate Reich, as in Reich, as in uh, Holy Empire of the German terminology, as in Third Reich. And Nate Reich is the operations general safety manager for Safeway in Northern California. Uh, he wanted to drive her to Safeway, but she had the three patients with her, so she asked for help with the tire. He had no jack. Safeway went up in flames in front of both of them, but um, he turned out to be her angel. And somehow the three frail elderly patients, which could just have easily had been my parents while they were alive, and Kraft all jammed into Reich's little Ford. He pointed the car south. The sky is black as night. And they escaped. Now, weeks passed. All 91 patients had been resettled. Four are now with family. The rest spread among 15 nursing homes and two hospitals. Cipros Meadows is gone. Plum Healthcare Group, which owns it, and at least uh, 55 other facilities in California and Nevada has held two job fairs for its displaced workers and hopes to employ them at its other properties. Aaron Edmonds, Plum's area president, says no decision has been made about rebuilding. Sarah Drummond and the two patients in her care are sheltered in place with other evacuees and law enforcement agents. First one in Paradise parking lot and then another wrapped in fire blankets, those silver space age sheets that they give to protect you when the flames roar directly over you. You never want to use those, ever. That's a last resort you had better hope you never experience. Well, she and the others survived it, using these space age blankets as flames burned over them. And she now plans to leave California. So in that sense, Donald Trump's Republican Satan has had their victory in driving people away that we desperately need to work with the elderly population of aging baby boomers, either here or anywhere else in the United States. Now, Olivia Drummond uh, doesn't know if her house in Megalia is even still standing. She had a prenatal checkup on Wednesday of last week. She heard the baby's heartbeat. Kraft went back to see her house in the nursing home for the first time since flames rushed through the town she was born in, only to find all those elements destroyed. All that's left of Cypress Meadows are a wavy metal roof and a tangle of ruined equipment. The abandoned wheelchairs, most totally burned, remain quayed up in front of what, what was once a graceful entrance. Their big tires lying on the blackened ground, reduced to circles of white ash, which crumble when you touch them. And yet still, the relentless rise in the number of dead and missing keeps a climbing as Russia's puppet President Donald Trump visited Northern and Southern California yesterday, on Saturday, this weekend, to tour the burn areas and see the impacts of the wildfires that he and his followers generated, that he gave the orders to start when he gave the coded encrypted text message Happy birthday, Marines, on November 11th. He's been sharply critical of our state, blaming the fires on poor forest management, even though the majority of them are nowhere near forests. And that brings us to the politics of Trump's visit to California to assess wildfires damage. The damage, his kill count, and what he was the cause of is something he's secretly proud of in his reports to his master handler, Vladimir Putin. And in terms of what he has to report of all the damage he's done, he's got a lot to be proud of.
Now, during visits to other natural disaster sites, Trump has focused only on meeting with first responders and public officials and has had almost no direct contact whatsoever with victims. Certainly none whatsoever in terms of meeting with victims as compared to his predecessors, who would always meet directly with victims of such events. And this was just Trump's second visit to the nation's most populous state. We have more of a larger population than any other state in the fucking union. This is only the second time he's visited us since his election. His first California visit, which he made in March to inspect border wall prototypes in the San Diego area and to attend a fundraiser in the Beverly Park home of Edward Glazer, the co-chairman of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers professional football team. This visit, or rather that precedent visit, came later in his term than for any White House occupant since Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who also hated California as a center of resistance against his starting World War II. Now, Trump, the direct precursor to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was a Stalinist stooge, Trump, being a Putinista, has had a particularly combative relationship with California over environmental, immigration, and other policies. The state's Democratic leaders, including Governor Jerry Brown, House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi of San Francisco, Representative Adam Schiff of Burbank, and Representative Maxine Waters of Los Angeles, have all been frequent Trump targets and to varying extents, the faces of the resistance to him, which was why they were all targeted by pipe bombs when his assassin, his anointed assassin, tried to conduct mass murder via the postal delivery system. Mr. Uh, oh God, I'm forgetting his name now. But uh, he, of course, failed in that attempt. And uh, since that time, he's been taken into custody and uh, he, of course, would never have even have been identified if it weren't for the fact he used to be a male stripper who danced on the same circuit, stripped the same circuit, as our brother in battle, Daniel Orola, who tells me his name is Caesar Syak Jr., who's pleaded not guilty. His trial's not even scheduled until July of 2019. Florida's Caesar Sayoc, of course, was the man who was supposed to kill all of these people in California, those across the nation who resisted Donald Trump. And the trail of slime leads directly back to that white trash piece of shit who occupies the Oval Office in the name of motherfucking Russia. And, of course, Trump renewed tensions in the midst of the wildfires with accusatory tweets that angered many in my state, even before he arrived. Last weekend, he wrote, there'd be no reason for these massive, deadly and costly forest fires in California, except that forest management is so poor. Billions of dollars are given each year and so many lives lost, all because of gross mismanagement of the forest. Remedy now or no more Fed payments. Now, all experts have called that tweet uninformed and that's being far too kind and generous. Many politicians and residents called it insensitive. Again, that's being far too understated. Our governor-elect Gavin Newsom responded, this is not a time for partisanship. This is a time for coordinating relief and response and lifting those in need up. The president of California professional firefighters, Brian Rice, called the tweet ill-informed, ill-timed, and demeaning to those who are suffering, as well as the men and women on the front lines. Adding, at this moment, thousands of our brother and sister firefighters are putting their lives on the line to protect the lives and property of thousands. Some of them are doing so even as their own homes lay in ruins. In my view, this shameful attack on California is an attack on all our courageous men and women on the front lines, everywhere. Meanwhile, lawmakers in Congress have begun debating how and when to send supplemental disaster relief to assist in California's eventual recovery. Members in both parties have dismissed the president's tweeted threat to revoke funding. Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont, the senior Democrat on the senior Senate Appropriations Committee, said that Senate Democrats will insist that additional California fire funding be included as part of any broader disaster spending package. Leahy confirmed, withholding funds is not a solution. We will fight for it. In the United States, we've always come together on disasters. There's going to have to be money for a number of natural disasters that occur throughout the country. It's not just the fires in California. And what I would not agree to is have one face off against another. 
And while not echoing the president's call to withhold money from California, Senator Richard Shelby of Alabama, the Republican chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee, said it's too soon to know if wildfire relief money will be included in a broader must-pass spending bill in December, saying that is a horrible situation in California. A lot of people are really burnt. I would hope that we would consider things on their merits. Per Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein of San Francisco, who came into power through the assassination of San Francisco Mayor, Mr. Uh, oh God, I'm trying to remember George Moscone's name. George Moscone was the mayor of San Francisco who was assassinated by Dan White, an MK Ultra mind control victim who never spent a day in jail. Also killed, of course, the so-called mayor of Castro Street, the gay supervisor, Harvey Milk. Dan White is the person who brought Senator Dianne Feinstein into mayoralty by secession process through murder. At least I can agree with Dianne Feinstein when she says, we want the maximum we can get. Well, she may be a bitch, but she's our bitch on a leash in this case. The president had already approved a disaster declaration for California, making federal funding available for recovery efforts of Butte, Los Angeles, and Ventura counties last week. But such funding be just the first step in addressing the state's needs. So while visiting Paradise, California, to assess the damage done by the deadly campfire, Trump issued statement about his Finland-based solution for California wildfires, insisting that California could prevent wildfires by paying more attention to forest floors saying California needs to spend more time raking and cleaning the forest floors as if they were our backyard, you know, in uh, where we all just kind of go out voluntarily en masse and, uh, you know, do such things. Uh, you know, he did this while standing next to California Governor Jerry Brown and Governor-elect Gavin Newsom, both men who I've met personally. And he was with them at Peel Air Force Base on Saturday. Trump stated the president of Finland told him that taking care of the forest floors has helped the country avoid wildfires. So, um, to quote as Trump, you have to take care of the floors, the floors of the forest, very important. You look at other countries where they do it differently and it's a whole different story. I was with the president of Finland and he said, we're a forest nation and they spend a lot of time on raking and cleaning and doing things and they don't have any problem. And when they do, it's a very small problem. You gotta take care of the floors. You know, the floors of the forest, very important. I was with the president of Finland. Yeah. And uh, of course, he worships these Scandinavian nations because they're all Nordic whites. And uh, he thinks that, you know, they all go out there uh, with rakes and uh, just, you know, do this like it was all like uh, uh, an extension of uh, what you do when you trim uh, your hedges in front of your home. And he predicted that spending more time raking forest floors would work out well preventing future wildfires in California. Now, um, a number of Twitter users, I did make a sweep, were unsure if one could compare California's climate to Finland's climate. A handful of other users pointed out that Finland has had its share of recent forest fires despite its forest management policies. Uh, as a matter of fact, a Finnish researcher and lecturer named Veli Pekka Kivimäki tweeted, I perhaps wouldn't compare Finland and California climate-wise, and besides, 80% of the country is classified as forest land. We don't exactly manicure all of it. And I think it was probably better when I read the tweet by Billy Procida, a comedian, who said, someone please show Donald Trump a globe so he knows how close to the north fucking pole Finland is in comparison to southern fucking California. Now, we already have the answer here, and it's logging. That's the answer for California. Facing deadlier fires, California is trying something new, more logging. Environmentalists and the timber industry, after long budding heads, increasingly agree that cutting trees to thin forests is vital to reducing fire danger. Obscured amid the chaos of California's latest wildfire outbreak is a striking sign of change that may help curtail future devastating inferno. And uh, basically, it's our environmentalists and logging supporters largely coming to agreement that forests need to be logged to be safe. Now, as deadly fires continue to rage in Northern and Southern California, millions of people outside the burn zones are exposed to dangerous smoke. Health officials and firefighters are fitted for the right mask, the general public not so. 
Parts of Northern California had the worst air of anywhere in the world on Friday of last week when I went to see my medical cosmetologist personally to help me care about my collapsed lung issues or care for them. She herself being a burn victim that got involved with medical cosmetology to care for her own needs in the wake of some veteranoid asshole, some subhuman veteran back when she was a Veterans Administration bureaucrat and worked for the feds handling cases of demented combat veterans. One of them became essentially a stalker who shoved a pipe bomb into her automobile, which got her involved thereafter with medical cosmetology to care for her own recovery. And she came to help me driving through miles of smoke and fire because of my collapsed lungs so that I could survive the worst day in California history in terms of air quality in San Francisco when our air quality became the worst in the world. It was the day San Francisco went black and white. Everything around us in terms of visibility became black and white. On Friday, going into the weekend, as the Bay Area continued to choke on smoke from Butte County's deadly campfire, air quality in the Bay Area reached code red hazard levels and Northern California was confirmed as having the dirtiest air in the world. The National Weather Service doesn't believe the smoke will clear anytime soon. Suzanne Sims, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service, says the winds are light and offshore, so there's nothing to move the smoke. It's there and it's not going anywhere. There'd be no relief in sight. The San Francisco Bay Area can't expect significant relief from the wildfire smoke choked air until next week. A forecast earlier in the week indicated a system moving through the area Sunday night and kicking up a wind that would have blown the smoke out. Then, of course, the system isn't going to make it close enough to spare our air. Dire Bay Area air conditions now be forecast through Tuesday at the least. So the current weather patterns going to hold through Tuesday. And on Wednesday, a storm in the forecast is expected to finally bring relief from the eye stinging lung choking polluted air all of this is particulate matter that goes to the bottom of your lungs stays there forever it's not what impacts you now with the smell it's decades from now when it shaves years off your life spencer tangent a meteorologist with the national weather services monterey office says there'll be a change in wind direction and that clean marine air coming in from the pacific that onshore wind will be stronger and it'll help mix out the smoke and push the smoke out. Thus, the soonest Bay Area may see relief is Wednesday when a storm is set to hit the Bay Area. There's also a 30 to 40% chance of rain on Wednesday, and the rain will actually remove some of the smoke itself. Rain also returns to the forecast on Thursday with a 40 to 50% chance, but for now, the smoke is here to stay. And to all my fellow Californians, if you want to escape, let me tell you how far you'd have to drive to get out of the bad air. It's gotten harder and harder to breathe in the Bay Area since the campfire. And since this most destructive fire in California history began tearing through Butte County last week and on Thursday last week, air quality took its turn for the worse, so gravely as to have since led many to purchase special masks to filter out the particulate matter so it wouldn't lodge in their lungs. By now, residents have been choking on toxic eye sting and smoke for days even as this campfire in butte county continues to rage san francisco airport has seen delays due to low visibility the conditions have shut down schools san francisco schools were closed on friday the big game between stanford and cal has been postponed for the first time in 55 fucking years because of the poor air quality because the players on the gridiron would have turned into human vacuum cleaners sucking up soot that would have shaved years off their lives. And football's already dangerous enough. So with schools and colleges canceling classes and sporting events, even with what I will tell you will very shortly in our lifetimes be recognized instead of Thanksgiving 
but rather as the original people's Holocaust Memorial Day weekend. All too fast approaching. You might be wondering how far you have to drive if you want to get out of the smoke altogether. And the answer is pretty fucking far. And even then, it's not a sure thing that the smoke won't drift after you. The last time I did research uh, on this was as of 1 p.m. Thursday of last week when I found out that if you want to air at green or healthy levels from San Francisco, you would have to drive three hours. That's 139 miles east to Tuolumne or Red Hills, 121 miles, three and a half hours northwest of Point Arena or southeast of Madeira, 168 miles, four hours, 161 miles northeast or northwest, excuse me, to Truckee or northeast to Fort Bragg, which would be about 172 miles, four hours, 187 miles to South Lake Tahoe, four hours, 238 miles southeast to SLO or uh, SLO, the uh, south area or Morro Bay, as I know it myself, rather than by these new acronyms that they've assigned these geographic locations. 239 miles, that be. Five hours southeast to Santa Inez, 303 miles. Nipomo, 263 miles. Lompoc, 298 miles. Or Santa Maria, 269 miles. Or five hours, 233 miles northeast to Portola. I checked it all out because I was trying to find out how to get V to me, my medical cosmetologist, just in the safest way possible. And the SLO, the acronym she kept telling me about, I found out was the acronym for San Luis Obispo, which I've always referred to by name. Uh, but uh, she kept saying SLO from where she was at at the time. So when I sourced the meteorologist, meteorologist with the National Weather Service, Spencer Tajan, and I'm going to quote him yet again. He says, down around Monterey and Santa Cruz, it's not as bad. The smoke is pushing out of the Central Valley at the low point and then pushing out through the Bay Area. So getting out of the Bay Area is probably the best bet for getting out of the worst of the bad air conditions. Conditions are expected to worsen slightly along the Central Coast in the next few days, but it still will likely be better than around the Bay. That's according to Tangent. And the smoke is less thick at elevations above 2,000 to 3,000 feet. So people looking to escape the bad air should consider higher elevations. If you're down for a semi-major road trip, levels are also green in the San Gabriel Valley, various areas around Los Angeles and Joshua Tree. On Thursday, when I was researching all of this so that V could come visit me on Friday, air quality in the Bay Area was hitting the most dangerous levels since the fire began. And as of 1 p.m. that day, fine particle levels in San Francisco hit the number 211 on the scale, veering into extraordinarily hazardous territory for the first time ever this year. And National Weather Service meteorologist Drew Peterson was saying, within the last 36 hours, this is definitely the worst air quality we've ever seen on record. Very little of the smoke is leaving the state. The only smoke that's left the state is going through the Golden Gate Gap and through Point Reyes. Pretty much all the smoke generated by this fire is ending up here. Now it's tempting to try to escape the smoke, but we should also note there's a spare the air alert in effect. Certainly it was on Tuesday. I believe it was on through the weekend, a record 13 day stretch. So people have been encouraged to avoid driving as much as possible, at any rate, in order to avoid contributing to all the air pollution. And at any rate beyond that, the smoke be spreading. National Weather Service meteorologist Drew Peterson has confirmed that smoke from the fire is filling the entire Sacramento Valley, suffocating the capital of our golden state, creating a deep reservoir of polluted air, a light offshore wind, gently pushing the smoke from the valley, to the southwest towards the delta. When the smoke hits this narrower opening in the valley, it fans out, spreading across the Bay Area. Here the air be stagnant, and little smoke is escaping through the Golden Gate skinny opening. Peterson has explained, more smoke is able to enter through the Central Valley than is able to exit through the Golden Gate. We're just getting this stay feet of smoke from the Central Valley, and then once it's here, it doesn't have a way to get out. With a high pressure system parked over Northern California, this pattern is expected to hold through Tuesday. 
and air quality is going to remain within this extraordinarily hazardous range, and we're all under house arrest if we value our health. So the Bay Area Air Quality Management District extended its winter spare the air alert through Tuesday of next week. Residents should limit outdoor activity as much as possible, continue to listen to health information from the local authorities. It's like we're experiencing nuclear war and a radiological bomb, a dirty bomb, a radiation bomb has been unleashed. And we've got to wait for the radiation to dissipate. So on a lighter note, if you cannot go to Lake Tahoe for the air, November is National Novel Wedding Month. And a long weekend is coming up that many Americans call Thanksgiving, but have to learn to refer to as the original American First Nations People's Holocaust Memorial Day. And you can go to nanorimo.org to access a novelist's key to productivity. Or I can tell you a good example that I can think of that comes to my mind. Again, nanorimo.org is spelled N-A-N-O, as in nano, R-I, oh, excuse me, W-R-I, as in write, W-R-I, uh, the way we spell writing. And W-R-I is followed up by an M-O, all one word, nanorimo, N-A-N-O, W-R-I. MO.org. And uh, I think, of course, if you go there and inspire yourself to write that novel the world needs while you're trapped indoor through a weekend like this, it reminds me of since Trump loves the uh, fucking Scandinavians so much, it reminds me of the Norwegian author Carl of Nausgaard. And his surname spelled K-N-A-U-S-G-A-A-R-D. And Nausgaard used to struggle with writer's block, despite having all the time he needed for writing. But once he had children and a more hectic life, he became far more prolific, writing the six-book series, My Struggle. Now, that's the reason I know about Karl of Nausgaard, is because he wrote this six-book series, My Struggle, which is named after Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kampf. And I've always wondered why he was able to rip off that title of that particular book, one of the best sellers in the world, aside from Karl Marx's Das Kapital and the Bible. Why is it he's been able to rip that off and not be targeted for it? But he wrote this six book series, My Struggle, between 2009 and 2011, uh, closing it up in the year my late and sainted Cyrus, my mother died. And uh, it was back then I took to reading it just for escape from all my misery at the time. Now, his experience suggests limited time is useful, and waiting for inspiration is a recipe for getting nothing done. So bear that in mind, and you might as well just dive into writing. And I recommend that for Ramona Halitha Henry, a grand madam whose entire life with so many children as she's been dealing with, now, I don't want to go too far into her uh, personal existence, but uh, she deals with quite a bit uh, due to her own daughter and uh, the adoption of many kids from all over the world. That deserves a sick book series. That deserves the title, My Struggle. In the meantime, some real talk here. Will staying inside really save you from the wildfire smoke? Is being indoors even really enough? You've got your local bowling alleys packed all weekend, children currently outnumbering springs at your local trampoline park. Bay Area parents are doing whatever they can to protect their kids from the potentially damaging effects of wildfire smoke. And for many, that means trapping them inside an enclosed space where they won't be tempted to run and inhale. But it's simply going indoors isn't even enough to protect your family from wildfire smoke. I mean, we're talking about for the, at this point, the what, dozenth straight day, Bay Area air quality's in the red. And of course, uh, last week when I was doing research into this, uh, residents were repeatedly warned to stay inside. If you're vigilant about airflow, that may limit your exposure to potentially damaging particles to some degree. But uh, Walter Wallace of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, noting that such places are likely to be running in an air infiltration system, he asserts a lot of places like the movie theaters and the museums that are open are supposed to have the doors closed as much as possible. This is much better than being outdoors because of the air filtration system. Uh, still, the doors on your local mall are opening all the time, and your home probably doesn't have the largest filtration system. 
unless you've got a tightly sealed clean room, you may not be seeing a huge benefit from being indoors. Dr. Carrie Nadu, her surname spelled N-A-D-E-A-U, she's a friend of my psychiatrist, Dr. Tao Tran, the one who took care of the worst aspects of my post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms through deep regressive hypnosis and suppression. Her friend Carrie Nadu uh, is the director of the Sean Parker Center for Allergy and Asthma Research at Stanford University, who admits there be no safe area, period. It's just a little less. The minute you have the windows open, it just gets dispersed. These conditions increase the likelihood of stroke and heart attack for people over 65. Dr. Nadu suggested that several consecutive days of air quality, similar to what the Bay Area has seen this week alone, could do as much damage as smoking a cigarette every fucking day for an entire goddamn year, even if you're spending the bulk of your time indoors. That's how bad these fires are. Just a week of exposure and what we're going through here in the city of San Francisco is going to do as much damage to my lungs, which have already suffered multiple collapses, and to those of anyone else aside from myself, as smoking a cigarette every day for a fucking year, even when we're spending all our time indoors. The potentially damaging particles are just too goddamn small to avoid. While there have been studies of the effects of wildfire smoke, there's no research that'll tell you how long your door can be open or how new your windows need to be to protect you from wildfire smoke. Now, Dr. Natto goes so far as to advise wearing an N95 rated mask, potentially even while indoors, if you truly want to limit your exposure to damaging particulate matter. Ethan Wills concluding herself that only better public planning on wildfire mitigation be the best way to really protect our lungs and air quality going forward. For Dr. Nadu, the answer is to stop the fires before they happen, just as I've said with my idea for drone pipes in major cities across the United States. Now, what she recommended in terms of a mask indoors, N95, P100, what do all these mask numbers mean? How does one know it's keeping them safe? Not all of them provide adequate protection. With dangerous air quality from the devastating campfire near Chico forcing hundreds of schools to cancel class, hundreds of thousands of parents to scramble for child care, and our lungs to scramble for air, it may be time to actually pay attention to what the numbers and codes on these dust masks we're all recommended really mean. Anyone who's worked with drywall, remove paint, or crawled into an attic has probably strapped on one of these cheap white masks. N95 is common and is what's been recommended for smoke, but for a buck or two more, you can get N99. What's the difference? The 95 refers to 95%, as in it blocks 95% of the particles or filtration efficiency per the NIOSH CFR 84 test. Now, uh, of course, one of my majors being criminal psychology, we sometimes veered into fire technology and safety because of arson. But I'm trying to remember what the acronym NIOSH or NIOSH CFR even stood for. And to tell you the truth, I really can't. <laughs> I, uh, to my shame and embarrassment, uh, I'm going to need a friendly individual to maybe look that up for me and enter that into uh, communications so that we can uh, catch up on uh, that. Uh, however, I do want people to know that uh, in terms of these numbers, uh, N99 means 99% filtration efficiency per that NIOSH CFR 84 test. And N100, you guessed it, it blocks 100% of particulates, or at least 99.9997% to be exact. N100 is the equivalent of a HEPA filter for your face. And the HEPA acronym, again, it's been so long since I worked with the concept of uh, biological chemical warfare, uh, I seem to remember HEPA, H-E-P-A, is standing for high efficiency particulate air. So uh, high efficiency particulate air filter is a type of mechanical air filter. It works by forcing air through a fine mesh that traps harmful particles such as pollen, pet dander, dust mites, and tobacco smoke. 
So uh, selecting and using an air filter, you could probably find HEPA filters in most air purifiers. And uh, having an N100 uh, mask is like having a HEPA filter for your face. And that is probably what you want to get. Uh, uh, of course, I've been told by Garrett Mead, uh, shout out to he, that uh, we have uh, are losing big chunks of broadcast that I keep fading in and out, but hopefully uh, most of it is being recorded, so at least people can review it later on when it's stored. Uh, I'm going to review uh, my messages here, and there's nothing coming to me through uh, Paul Edward. Uh, I am getting messages from Skype saying I have poor network connection. So what we're dealing with are Skype transmission issues. And um, uh, our friend Paul is doing the best he can. Now, let me get back to the N100 masks. Uh, N100 is required for lead and asbestos, but it would certainly be good for smoke. And if you see a P, it filters exactly the same stuff. The only difference is it also filters out oil-based aerosols if you were working with chemicals. A P100 or N100 are both equal in terms of filtering out soot from a wildfire. So why do some masks have snouts while others don't? That's to let exhaled hairs escape. If you're blown out, your pressure means particles are not getting in. So the valve lets you exhale quickly, and then it closes and resumes filtering as you suck back in air. As for the cost, if it's at the 99 cent store or Home Depot, does it even matter? PK Safety writes in its clear language guide, that it's helpful to note that since government agencies determine these ratings, one N95 mask that is more expensive than another will not provide some kind of better N95 protection. So if you trust the rating system, you may not need to pay more, but the more expensive masks may have better straps and better seals and therefore higher quality reinforcement. If the mask isn't sealed around your face, you're just breathing through the edges and it doesn't filter much at all. Men with beards cannot get the whole benefit of a mask and many men have looked at shaving it off for the sake of their lungs. Now, 3M Corporation writes in its handy but rather complex guide that I have in front of me, do not use tight-fitting respirators or loose-fitting face pieces with beards or other facial hair or conditions that prevent direct contact between the face and the edge of the respirator though I've since discovered that some PK safety masks are manufactured specifically for bearded men or even those with smaller faces, like children or um, immigrants from Asia. Now, protective systems recommend a half face mask or a full face mask if you really want to save your beard, but also filter your air. If you thought people in face masks looked funny when folks first started wearing them, this is a whole other level of awkward, but who knows? Face masks look pretty normal now, so maybe this will too. The whole point of my ruminating be to provide some clarity. Now for some confusion. Sacramento, the capital of our golden state, has stopped recommending masks. They say it they make it harder to breathe since you have to suck air through all those layers of material. Apparently for some people, yes, polluted air is better than no air if they're short of breath. In a statement from the county, health experts say, the Sacramento County Public Health Officer does not recommend use of N95 respirator masks for the general public. The use of the N95 respirator mask is only recommended for those near the fire who do not have the option to be indoors or have access to filtered slash recirculated air. N95 respirator used by those with heart and respiratory diseases can be dangerous and should only be done under a doctor's supervision. Now, I must add myself, also, it's unclear how long the masks will protect you. Medical masks are changed often because you don't want germs sitting on the outside that will infect you when you touch them. But particulate masks pretty much work till their pores get loaded and filled up. Certainly a mask doesn't last you all year, but 3M Corporation recommends generally these filters should be used and reused subject only to considerations of hygiene, damage, and increased breathing assistance. So the California Department of Public Health recommends swapping masks daily, if possible, meaning you use them once for a 24 hour period and you throw them away. Consider them disposable. 
Now, that brings us finally to more bad news for the private corporation that essentially provides us all our power, Pacific Gas and Electric. There's more bad news for PG&E as regulators look into not only whether it started the Paradise Fire, but its corporate governance. Now, the worst wildfires in recorded California history promised to reshape the state's utilities as Pacific Gas and Electric and Southern California Edison face billions of dollars in potential liabilities and growing calls to overhaul their systems to better prevent wildfires. California's top energy regulator says he's not too worried about PG&E bankruptcy, but says the state faces a bigger question. And I agree with him. California lawmakers had the chance to reduce PG&E's liability for wildfires, but chose not to continue with the efforts. Michael Picker, president of the California Public Utilities Commission and California's top utility regulator, says he doesn't believe PG&E is headed towards bankruptcy, despite the mounting threat of billions of dollars of legal liability from wildfires, asserting that the bigger worry is what to do to stop the onslaught of devastating wildfires the state has seen in recent years. And he's acknowledged that PG&E could file for bankruptcy at some point, but says we don't see that as something immediate. To quote as he, I have not been focused on bankruptcy. That's a news media preoccupation. PG&E's woes are a small slice of a bigger shit pie. That's his words, not mine. He says that's a technical term. What is California doing about wildfires? Now, that's his question. That's his challenge. Now, Picker call us out climate change, a major unanswered issue, and says we have to have other solutions. Now, despite news reports about power lines causing fires, only one out of 10 wildfires is caused by utility infrastructure issues. California wildfires have been traced to a variety of ignition sources, including sparks from vehicles and machinery, arson, of course, and lightning. Now, alluding to ongoing debates about forest management policies, as uh, slingshotted by Donald Trump, Picker said he worries about the estimated 130 million dead trees in the High Sierra that could ignite from causes other than power line problems because there's no power lines out there. So the Public Utilities Commission president acknowledged PG&E's growing financial costs and liabilities are concerned. The state needs to take further steps to ensure the utility, which supplies power in Northern California, has continued borrowing ability at decent rates. It says he's been on several conference calls in the last week with utility investigators and executives, investors and executives rather, and he's been calming nerves and sending a message that the PUC and state legislator are working to maintain the utility company's financial stability. Now, there's a reason I'm going into all this, because we're going to get into the mystery behind these fires, because it's this private corporation that's being accused of starting them. But the more pressing priority is to help PG&E assess low-cost borrowing. Now, per picker, the challenge is that as the cost of borrowing goes up, so do people's rates, and that's what we need to avoid. Now, PG&E has been hit with numerous lawsuits in the last year, stemming from major wildfires believed to be caused by power line issues. Recently completed CAL FIRE investigations have determined that 17 Northern California wildfires in yesteryear, 2017, were started by issues with PG&E power infrastructure. And the utility took a major public relations hit last week and this week when it reported problems with one of its power lines in Butte County near a suspected starting point for the devastating campfire at about the time the fire ignited. Now, CAL FIRE officials have stated officially they're investigating several possible fire causes and multiple ignition points. That's the key point with myself multiple ignition points, security enforcement agents. These are private mercenary security officers. What you lay public people would call security guards. They are actually mercenary agents of security enforcement, as I was myself the years I was serving mercenary in all kinds of contracts, including within the domestic areas of the United States like the Acorn Projects in Oakland. Now, these private mercenaries associated with Cal Fire Wednesday of last week blocked off a section of Concow Road between Mountain Pine Lane and Rim Road. That closure was related to Cal Fire's investigation into the campfire. 
Now, nevertheless, on Friday, former Chico and Oroville police chief Kirk Trossel and his wife Patty Garrison, a retired school principal, sued PG&E, contending the utility company failed to take appropriate safety steps. The couple's paradise home was destroyed in the campfire. A Bay Area attorney filed a similar suit against the utility on Tuesday of last week on behalf of several other fire victims. So PG&E's stock prices have plummeted since the campfire started, but I'm happy to say they rebounded slightly on Friday. No, I'm not a shareholder. Now, PG&E officials reiterated this week that the fire cause has not been determined and said they're working with first responders in Butte to help the community. The state legislature moved this summer to improve PG&E's financial position by allowing it to borrow money to pay expenses from yesteryear's fires and to pass some of those costs on to its customers. The new law also sets up a process to let PG&E pass fire-related costs to consumers for fires sparked after January 1st of next year, 2019, but it doesn't apply to 2018 fires throughout this year. Picker said his attorneys have told him the PUC may be able to adjust its standards to include 2018 fires when it considers any PG&E requests for rate adjustments. Now, Picker's comments to get off this subject drew rebuke from TURN, the Utility Reform Network. That's what the ad acronym is for. It's a watchdog group. And TURN Executive Director Mark Tony wrote, PG&E's record of criminal negligence is well known to the CPUC, California Public Utilities Commission. It's about time that the authorities starting holding PG&E's board of directors accountable for the actions of management and the destruction those actions have wrought over the years. Which the none of these people, because they want fast money, they smell blood, they're going after an easy target. It's what's called a whale. And they want to beach it and feast off it. The power that it cuts off to the rest of us thereafter be damned. But the real mystery is the second start, as it's been referenced, of the Paradise Fire. The mystery campfire second start. I need to know, was it captured on Firewatch camera? About five miles southwest of Poe Dam, investigators are looking at a second start to the campfire that adds, of course, to the arson that I've been describing going on all over California under Republican insurgency. Firefighter radio transmissions indicate that a second start of the campfire was caught on a fire watch camera near Concow Reservoir about a half hour after the first flames were reported about five miles northeast near Poe Dam and Polga, P-U-L-A-G-A. Now, at 7.04 a.m. November 8th, a fire dispatcher rerouted a couple of fire crews to a second fire, quote-unquote, on Rim Road, just east of Concow Reservoir. That would have been called the Rim Fire had it not been merged with the Campfire. Now, satellite images indicate that Rim Road crisscrosses underneath several PG&E high-tension lines in that vicinity. There'd be no obvious radio discussions indicating what may have sparked that second fire in a review of archived radio chatter that I was able to access some of from my old security and police connections. Now, minutes later, a firefighter described the initial blaze as having grown to about 300 acres with a rapid rate of spread and heading towards Concow Reservoir. Firefighters responding to the second ignition alerted other crews to two little kids walking the road along the lower portion of Rim Road, also called Andy Mountain Road, near Jarbo Gap on Highway 70. Now that's where I know for a fact there was activity with the Chochoa in the past who do everything they can to monopolize the trade of opiates in the San Francisco Greater Bay Area Metroplex region. But beyond that, they serve the anti-gods as a servitor race brought over here by the Central Intelligence Agency after the fall of Saigon. 
Now I've got far more in depth in their history in the past and how they're constantly, chronically misidentified as really ugly, mongoloid looking kids, potentially with Methuselahs or Down syndrome. But on Thursday, the Chico Enterprise record reported that security enforcement agents had set up a roadblock the day before outside Concow. Later, Cal Fire Butte County Chief Darren Reed confirmed that investigators had identified a possible second origin for the fire. He did not release any additional information regarding the second origin point, saying the fire remained under investigation. It was then that Cal Fire spokesman Scott McLean also declined to elaborate. That was Friday, saying only so much as that our investigators, Cal Fire, have identified a possible second origin for the campfire. The fire remains under investigation. No further details will be released at this time. So importantly, no cause has been determined for the campfire. And that's according to Cal Fire officials themselves. In addition to the first radio reports of a downed power line near Poe Dam, where the first ignition began, PG&E reported to state regulators that minutes before the fire was reported, a transmission line had a malfunction in area of the dam, and it's still unclear which fire watch camera possibly captured the second ignition. However, in 2014, PG&E announced it funded two million United States dollars to install 28 remote fire sensing cameras on some of the most important lookout towers in four counties, including Butte. Butte County District Attorney Mike Ramsey said Wednesday that PG&E is cooperating with fire investigators, but it was not clear whether the utilities transmission tower caused the fire. To quote his T, the district attorney's office was involved in anticipation that if anything is referred to us in terms of a criminal case, that we're on top of it right now. Now, all of this will be gone into more in depth in terms of the Cho. Their motivations to add to the terror being aligned as they are with the Red States Republicans on the basis of their deployment constantly in country, United States, by the Central Intelligence Agency and by the United States Department of Defense to terrorize the American population with dreams and sleep paralysis, bad dreams and sleep paralysis. And the Cho would be more than capable of generating a firestorm in service of terrorism for the Republican Party. Now, all of this might sound hyperbolic, even laughable to the uninitiated, those ignorant of the Asian minority group known as the Chochoa. If so, they've never heard what I brought up before, and they'd best tune in to our next transmission on Wednesday night. That's when I'll cover these dream experiences being had by people all over the world having the exact same dreams of terror. The Hat Man, the Shadow Man, and the connection to the Chochoa, and what happened to many of the Asian minorities that were imported into the United States as their food source until almost all died off and they were redirected to feed on the white population of the United States. Now, Governor Jerry Brown and Interior Secretary Ryan Zink met with Woolsey Fire Incident Commanders the governor urged officials to finish the long-delayed cleanup of the Santa Susana Field Laboratory nuclear site near where the fire started. And that brings us to technology. Kim Kardashian's private firefighters talked about these mercenary security enforcement agents in contract with a private company doing investigation for the state of California's Cal Fire, blocking off roads, encountering the Cho, which means black magician in the Tibetan. We even have a Cho chocolate headquartered in San Francisco, or did for a row. My exposure of them ran them out of business, as far as I understand it. If anyone finds Cho chocolate today, you let me know. Otherwise, when it comes to firefighting technology, responding to these emergencies generated by such subhumans, 
Kim Kardashian's private firefighters, her mercenary fire corps, exposes America's fault lines. Rich people don't get their own better firefighters, we're told, or at least they aren't supposed to. But as multiple devastating wildfires have been raging across California, a private firefighting crew of mercenary firemen has helped save Kanye West and Kim Kardashian's home in Calabasas. And Calabasas, of course, has been uh, reported one of the wealthiest areas in the world. The successful defense of this 50 million United States dollars mansion is probably the most prominent example I can think of of a trend that's begun to receive national attention. Four higher firefighters protecting homes, usually on the payroll of an insurance company with a lot at risk. So the insurance companies, AIG, the American International Group, and Chubb, CHBB, have publicly talked about their private wildfire teams. AIG has its own WPU, Wildfire Protection Unit, while Chubb, thank you, Zoe Brendan, he says chocolate is based out of uh, Oakland now, Cho Chocolate. Of course, they always claim they were in Oakland. They moved there. But when our roving correspondent, Holly Kaditis Kiefer, uh, shout out to her, went to visit that site, the building that was actually on footage and in photographs did not exist. Almost as if a building had been photoshopped to exist on site where they said their headquarters was. But when that site's visited, there's nothing but an empty lot. Much of this, of course, being a front. All of that we can go into a bit more on Wednesday. I mentioned AIG's mercenary wildfire unit, Chubb, has got uh, its own. And there's up to a dozen other insurers that I'm aware of who contract with WDS, Wildfire Defense Systems, a Montana mercenary company that claims to have made 550 wildfire responses on behalf of insurers, including 255 in just the past two years. Right now in California, that company has 53 fire engines, private mercenary fire engines, working to protect close to 1,000 wealthy homes. The... Story feels uniquely 2018. Financial capitalism, inequality, Kim Ye, you know, uh, Kanye West and Kim Kardashian, Kim Ye as a couple when they're siamized as twins, the fires of Armageddon. And of course, it is uniquely 2018 for Americans at least. The idea of private firefighting strikes us as an oddity nowadays, and it should. While other societies throughout history have relied on private firefighting companies to protect the property of the upper classes, for the most part, we in America have accepted the idea that fighting fire ought to be for a public good. In London, firefighters worked explicitly for insurance companies during the 18th and 19th centuries. The economist Annalisa Anderson has written that each insurance company maintained its own fire brigade, which extinguished fires in those buildings insured by the company, and in return for a fee to be paid later in buildings insured by other companies. Uh, Zoe Brendan follows up that he searched Google for Cho headquarters of Cho Chocolate, says it's 100 San Pablo Avenue, Berkeley. Quite strange indeed. And he thanks me for the reply. Anytime, Zoe, hugs. And uh, thank you for following up. I'll give a story about Cho and uh, its chocolate on, uh, you know, Wednesday. In the meantime, the United States, having seceded from the British Empire, might have been expected to inherit a similar system, but instead, volunteer fire departments became the most common means of fire protection. Insurers might give bonuses or other support to these groups, but firefighting was primarily a civic rather than commercial enterprise. Now, I've read several books on this recently. Uh, the one that comes to mind right now is titled Cause for Alarm. It's subtitled, The Volunteer Fire Department in the 19th Century City. Now, this book entitled Calls for Alarm, The Volunteer Fire Department in the 19th Century City is written by the historian Amy Greenberg, surname spelled G-R-E-E-N-B-E-R-G. 
She says these fire clubs were important social institutions, off-commingling middle-class and working-class men of many ethnicities in the virtuous activity of defending their city from conflagration. Now, David Torgerson, the president of Wildfire Defense Systems, this mercenary firefighters company, has disputed any characterization of his particular company as fighting fires only on behalf of the rich. 90% of the homes they protect, so he says, be average value homes, contracted through normal insurers, not the specialty companies that take on high net worth individuals' properties. To quote his tea, if the fire hits Malibu, there will be a lot of high value houses. If it hits somewhere in Utah, there won't be. In either case, he says, wildfire defense systems will respond. Many types of regular old fire insurance can come with his company service. He states, we serve nearly a dozen insurance companies. If anybody wants to have the supplemental response capability during a fire, they need to pick an insurance company that has it. There are not that many solutions in climate change. If we have a growing problem with wildfire, and it is statistically getting worse, why limit the ability to bring resources that the taxpayer doesn't have to pay for and policyholders don't have to pay for. Now, as a historian, I can tell you that in the 19th century, there were obvious reasons for residents to fight fires altogether. Great calamities of many kinds wiped out huge chunks of people and property within new industrial cities. The Stanford historian Richard White calls the rough-hewn communal politics of these urbanites a democracy of defecation. In his book entitled The Republic for Which It Stands, which I've also sourced, White has writ, like feces and urine, neither fire nor disease respected property boundaries. Water and sewer systems had to cover and protect everyone. Cities were like ships. They sailed and sank as a whole, as a holistic entity. And uh, thus, the first metropolitan fire services were born. Professionals paid by the city took over from the volunteers. They got a push from the new technological possibilities of steam engines, which reduced the need for human labor, but required more specialized technicians to operate them. Professional firefighters were needed, and municipal governments centralized the power to weld them and the funds to pay them. As the Arizona State fire historian Stephen Pine, surname spelled P-Y-N-E, has noted, this is the system that urban Americans encountered in the 20th century. The trusty firemen, the firehouse, the Dalmatians, all that. But over decades, urban firefighting benefited from stricter building codes and strong unions that kept departments staffed up. The development of wildfire management has been quite another phenomenon. From the early years of the 20th century until the late 1960s, the United States Forest Service adopted a line of fire suppression. Every fire was supposed to be put out, even in the wildlands that scientists later discovered needed to burn. Now, Pine has written a book I've also sourced. Again, the author's surname is spelled P-Y-N-E. The title of his book is California, a fire survey. In it, he states, and I quote, an estimated 54% of California ecosystems are fire dependent, and most of the rest are fire adapted. Fuel built up in natural cycles ground to a halt. Finally, after 1968, the Forest Service reversed course and began haltingly walking back on its no fire is good policy. Now, wildland firefighters have to manage forests that are fundamentally beyond their control. Urban firefighters, on the other hand, still want to put out every fire. Meanwhile, urban sprawl and exurbs, meaning external the suburbs are exurbia or uh, beyond the suburbs. <laughs> the exurbs continue to push further and farther into rural and even wild areas. So problems arise at the wildland urban interface where sprawl or exurb, which has to be protected like a city, meets back country that evolved to burn and should do so for the health of our environment. So altogether, what we are seeing at this point in history is the development of mercenaries to bridge that gap. And like mercenaries in a war zone, 
between actual fielded forces and plausible deniability. This interface between sprawl and exurb and the wildlands is exacerbated by troubling chasm. Since 1968, when the Forest Service started taking a more naturalistic approach to letting wildfires burn, it has also cut full-time fire staff. But the fires, driven by climate change and an expansion of that same wildland-urban interface, have grown ever more destructive. The campfire has killed more people and destroyed more buildings than any before it. And two months before this campfire started, the campfire had already exhausted 431 million United States dollars out of its total 443 United States uh, million United States dollars budget fighting earlier devastated fires. In other words, the state of California had a full blown budget of less than 444 million, meaning 443 million United States dollars, and they blew all of it. To be exact, they blew 431 million United States dollars of that 443 million United States dollars already fighting earlier fires before this campfire, the most destructive in our history, was even ignited. So that brings us back to the beginning in the mid-1980s and when all these wildfires became ever more impacted by climate change and they're accelerating in recent years, whilst the Forest Service budget cuts and increasingly prevalent wildfires simultaneous to our increasing debudgeting of our capabilities simultaneously together open the door for private contractors to assume roles formerly held by government employees. In some cases, that looks like insurance companies sending crews out a la 18th century London from the time of Jack the Ripper or Kim Ye, meaning Kanye and Kim Kardashian, Kanye West and Kim Kardashian, ordering up some firefighters like you would order a pizza to tend to their ants. But the change is broader and deeper than just that. Pine has written that the trend of privatized fire operations began seriously under the Reagan administration. And of course, that goes without saying. It's now a full program, complete with lobbyists. This goes far beyond private companies hired by insurance companies. So we're entering the age of the Italian Renaissance era condottieri, or mercenary officers, who thrive in a balkanized warring state at war with itself, where, of course, peace would be their undoing. These are the men who will thrive and prosper in the coming era of the burning West. The National Wildfire Suppression Association represents 250 private mercenary wildfire fighting companies who provide on-demand services to federal, state, and local governments. Budget cuts have forced privatization onto the Forest Service as the National Wildlife Suppression Association itself explainest when I've taken some of their pamphlets or accessed their websites the statement I've put together pretty much reads this. The emergence of private contract resources, national and regional 20-person firefighting crews, engines, dozers, tenders, and other specialized equipment, and support services such as caterers and shower slash hand washing units, gives agencies the flexibility they need to increase or decrease support with the most effective solution. Now that's according to NWSA Media Backgrounder. That association claims that now 40% of the resources across the United States are provided by private wildlife fire services. Now, not everyone would say this be a bad thing. The late libertarian economist, Fred McChesney, McChesney's uh, M-C-C-H-E-S-N-E-Y, argued that private for-profit production of fire services yields lower average costs than the cost of government provision for equivalent levels of output. And several libertarian economists have become fascinated 
with privatizing fire departments. It's not hard to imagine why. If you could prove you don't need the government to provide collective protection from conflagration, then what do you need government for at all? You see, this is why libertarians are your worst enemy. All the libertarians at the Presidio military base were child molesters. Rather, it worked the other way around. Because they were child molesters, they became political libertarians because they didn't want anyone interfering with their exploitation of children. This is why libertarians want to do away with child labor laws. I thank the gods of my ancestors that they got only 1% of the vote in the Democrat versus Republican runoffs in states like Georgia. Now, Torgerson, Torgerson, uh, surname spelled T-O-R-G-E-R-S-O-N, the president of Wildfire Defense Systems, even he paints a more complex portrait of emergency response generally than libertarian ideologists do. With all kinds of public perils, private companies are already frequently responsible for protection and cleanup. If you look at hazmat, trains, or oil spills, that's not a government action. Those who are responsible end up hiring private companies under the incident command. Wildfire is just this unique kind of thing where it is a government-managed incident with government resources, which hire lots of contractors. Kind of like war fighting in Iraq, where you've got as many mercenaries with boots on the ground as you've got Marines. Now, forgive me, my lungs are just starting to fill up with this soot because of my talking indoors. <clears throat> And the particulate matter is still enough where I see it in my sputum. <laughs> so um, I shan't be talking uh, too much longer, but probably will go another hour anyway, shortening my life by uh, a year on your behalf. <laughs> and, uh, I do that uh, to get the truth out. Mm. Suffering uh, for the sake of truth. Yes, there we are. I thank you for your patience with this and uh, apologize for your having to see this on air, so to speak. Um, but if I don't do this, I've got to drown in my own sputum as it uh, coagulates uh, coming out of my lungs and through my throat. Now, it's important that I finish this. The, the firefighting remains a bastion of public goods provision might be precisely why private companies' increasing involvement feels so controversial. Uh, this isn't a story of the kooky Kardashians doing things in the most publicity-friendly manner possible. It's a story of the ramifications of economic disparity in this nation, and frankly, I myself am flabbergasted. Firefighters are consistently ranked the most beloved of public servants, not just because they look good on calendars, but because they treat everyone equally. Rich people don't get their own better firefighters, or at least they're not supposed to. Or as one local firefighter in California summed up the case for public provisioning of fire protection to NBC media company earlier this year, he said, I could care less who owns the house. I just want to save as many as possible. Now, CARP, uh, who's a Brooklyn College, City University of New York historian, he essentially has expanded on the collectivist case, drawing in other prominent examples of areas of life that have undergone or could undergo privatization. Uh, the Brooklyn College professor Carp says, if we allow schools, libraries, policing, and firefighting to become a two-tiered system with one tier for the elite and another tier for everyone else, then that threatens the democratic Republican ideal of everyone contributing their fair share for the greater needs of the Commonwealth. Now, even in the early days of the American city, when volunteer and private fire companies were dominant, in the case of an emergency, every citizen capable of helping was expected to do so. And Carp, the historian himself, has concluded, if we don't fight fires together, then we will all burn together. Now, Victor Bailey, a historian at the University of Kansas, noted that this very ambivalence pervades American culture, arguing both sides 
in the face of devastating forest wildfires, the public services are inevitably stretched thinly. Why not add to those services by private ones? At another level, is it not better to put any extra resources into fighting the wildfire in the best way for everyone? And so even an asinine celebrity story can act like a fault line, slicing deep into the bedrock of what the United States is and exposing what different groups of Americans wanted to be. It's 2018 after all, and Victor Bailey has openly wondered are the present examples, Kanye West, Kim Kardashian, et alia, meaning all the rest, of them, them, and that thin end of a wedge that will lead to the wealthy buying better services in all these realms, education, policing, healthcare, firefighting? Are their examples something that's forthcoming? Are we already all the way down this path? And this is just a symptom we're beginning to see when it's already too late to operate. Well, I say it's not too late because, thank God, before I take a break at the top of the hour, just to gargle, get this particulate matter I've been sucking in like a vacuum cleaner all the while I've been talking the last three hours, even indoors. I say good riddance to the Reds, as in the Red Republican Party. We used to use the term Reds for the communists. These days we use it for a threat just as dire, just as grave, just as immediate, the clear and present danger of the Russian insurgency of American Republicans. But in California, we know we'll have a better, brighter, bluer future because we're saying good riddance to the Reds. Go and go and gone. They are entering irrelevance while we ride the blue wave. There's been more bad news for the California Republican Party as Orange County goes blue. Some Republicans are asking how they lost it all in Orange County. It's still a stunner. Orange County, once the epicenter of Sunbelt conservatism, is on track to send nothing but Democrats to the White House. Thursday night of last week, as county officials continued their vote tally, Democrat Katie Porter established an insurmountable lead over incumbent Republican Mimi Walters in the 45th Congressional District, giving Democrats yet another victory. And Porter's win marked the fifth Republican-held district in California that Democrats have flipped in this election. Earlier in the week, Republican Jeff Denham lost his re-election race in the Central Valley, Democrats already had beaten Republican representatives Donna Rohrabacher, known as Vladimir Putin's favorite politician in the United States, out of Orange County, and Steve Knight in northern Los Angeles County, and picked up the open seat in San Diego vacated by Representative Darrell Issa's retirement. And the sixth pickup was only a matter of time. The updated vote count Thursday by the Orange County Registrar voters had Democratic House candidate Jill Cisneros pulling 941 votes ahead of Republican Young Kim in an adjacent congressional district, even as David Valadao, who has repeatedly won in a district that covers a big swath of the Central Valley, was in a much closer race than expected. California, the once proud home of Ronald Reagan and other national Republican Party figures, may see its Republican representation fall to as few as eight seats in Congress, at the state level, the Republican Party faces an impotence against a Democratic supermajority in the legislature in our capital, Sacramento. Some, of course, worry about the effects of one-party rule in the nation's most populous and important state. But as I said, you cannot take the approach of moral equivalency, even if it's pox on both your house's stance, where you say the Republicans and the Democrats are equally incompetent, equally evil. That no longer applies. I've deconstructed that thoroughly in many of my latest transmissions. You have but to review what's on my archives. And what I need you to know is you cannot operate either as an independent party, the anarchists and independents, the libertarians only give the Republicans more power. You cannot win without working with what we've got. And the greatest, biggest, bluest hope we've got, the brightest blue, comes from the Democratic Party. For all its sins, for all its history, 
it's what we've got that can actually win, that we can actually make work. As California goes, so goes the nation. The one-party system you see here will be the one party of the United States when we ultimately win the next civil war against the Republicans, deport many of them to greater Manchuria, as I've insisted, and allow others to secede in their own white nation of the Southern Confederate States, as well as a new Africa in a black Confederacy down South. One which is not going to be outlined, as you might imagine, by state boundaries, but by county boundaries, dependent on ethnic majority, leading to some border gore, and of course, the kind of effect you saw on the maps in Bosnia, or Bosnia and Herzegovina in the Serbsky Croatian, Serbsky Kravatsky, or the Serbo Croatian language. And that will give our United States opportunity to at least offer our services as peacekeepers between New Africa and a second confederated American Republic. In the interim, extreme weather is shrinking the planet with wildfires, heat waves, rising sea levels. Our Pacific correspondent, Judith Ager, may very well talk about how Hawaii's recently lost an island in its marine reserve. The sea is rising. Large tracts of Earth are at risk of becoming uninhabitable due to all of these phenomena combined. But the fossil fuel industry continues its assault on the facts. That brings us, of course, back to California and the reason for the attacks on California by the Republicans, the direct orders given for insurgency by Donald Trump and the literally inflammatory arson attacks to destroy us because of our becoming the super blue state of the future. While this California fire season has been particularly destructive, it's only the latest stage in what the climate scientist Daniel Swain calls an astonishing multi-year fire siege. Three of the state's five largest fires on record have occurred in the past three years, all of them in Northern California. Millions of people have gotten used to living near big fires, sniffing the smoke when they open their door every morning, seeing the somber pink circle of the sun in the sky every evening. A smaller number have fled homes in the middle of the night or driven through a storm of embers, as my medical cosmetologist did to see myself on Friday of last week. Yet the worst is probably still to come for much of the state. The California fire season usually ends with the first rains of fall. In recent years, these rains have been arriving later and precipitation has concentrated in the darkest winter months. California's hilly scrubland is as driest and most fire prone right before the rains arrive. So their delay can lengthen and intensify the fire season. Climate change appears likely to push the rains to even later in the year. Insurance companies in particular have started to fear the worst. Aside from hiring mercenaries, they've been commissioning studies. And a recent RAND, which is a research and development, that's what that acronym is for, RAND, used to be affiliated with MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Back when I worked with the Department of Defense, I used to dream of becoming a think tanker working for RAND. And one of their recent studies, as commissioned by the insurance agencies, that in turn commissioned mercenaries to fight fires. One of their recent studies has found that home insurance premiums have risen in the state's most fire-prone areas compared with its less fire-prone areas. You don't really need a think tanker to tell you that. Some high-risk homeowners have switched to higher deductible policies. The same study estimated that as climate changes, the number of acres burned annually in the Sierra foothills will double in the next 30 years. If humans continue emitting carbon pollution at current rates, the number of acres burned will quadruple, increase by orders of magnitude multiplied by four by the year 2100 as we enter the 22nd century. Climate change has already made fires worse. A 2016 study in proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences found that climate change has doubled the number of acres burned across the American West since the 1980s. I brought this up before, but it comes to my mind again. And fires are not the only disasters that climate change will make worse, though they are among the most dramatic. Heat waves are the deadliest natural disasters in the United States, and they too, are becoming more frequent and intense as a result of human greenhouse gas pollution. 
they prove particularly deadly for senior citizens and infants. Forest fires might be seen as the particularly horrific edge of a sword that's coming for us all. Now, what I'll do is I'll finish up on Wednesday with what I was going to say tonight about the midterms because we are still in the midst of them with the finalization of counts and there's still some final conclusions to draw. So on Wednesday, before I go into the nature of dreams that are being shared all over the world under the nocturnal assault of sleep paralysis generated by the Chochoa, the Asian minority group imported to America by the thousands to infest your subconscious after the fall of Saigon. I will talk about, to introduce that subject, the 1974 midterms as a referendum on Richard Nixon, and of course, what they taught us about 2018 as a referendum on Trump, a comparison which can help us divine where we go from here, even while our sleep is assaulted by those deemed to be extraterrestrial aliens when people suffer sleep paralysis and feel they're being abducted by the little greys who are actually people from Asia that the majority of you have never heard of. I'm going to close for tonight after three hours of speech for the sake of my own health as I'm coughing up gray sputum with ash in it. And uh, that's disconcerting enough. So my love unto all, save my gang stalkers, who wished nothing but a long, suffering, degrading death unto myself and those I love, let such be rebuked and reflected unto them, as it was unto John Victor Lillier, who died in his final assault on myself. And let such be generated to all my gang stalkers who people can find the identity thereof just by going my Facebook, going down through the photos and all my past posts. You'll find enough information. All you need to know they're your enemy as well as the servants of the infernal and the anti-gods who have brought this hell upon us and wish to bring you and yours more than you've even seen so far. My love unto brother Pavel, brother Daniel Arola, sister in struggle, Rose Dio, our dear grand madam, Ramona Halitha Henry, our Pacific correspondent who should be on with us hopefully if we can get the technology right next Sunday, uh, Judith Dagert, and of course, unto you all. Good night.